Blake's. Oh, like, hey, Scoob, did you hear Nikki Blake is hosting a Scooby-Doo panel? No. Yeah. Like on today's Scooby-Doo episode, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy meet Nikki Blake. Yeah, in a Scooby panel. <laughs> Like we need to get this puppy started. <laughs> okay, Nicky Blake, take it away, Scooby Doo. <laughs> Welcome to the Scooby Panel. Today we'll be discussing Scrappy Doo. I'm your host, Nikki Blake from ScoobyAddicts.com, and I have some fun guests joining me today. So I'd like you guys to introduce yourselves. And Trevor, we're going to start with you. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Trevor Hawkins, and I am a very long time Scooby watcher and fan and uh, and an artist that uh, likes to do pop culture things. And Scooby's always been a big part of that. And uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And this has just been a lot of fun. Thanks, Nikki, for the chance. Thanks for being here. Justin. Hey, guys, I'm Justin. Uh, my account is uh, at Collector Scooby. Uh, I've been a big Scooby fan all my life. I'm uh, glad to be back, especially for this uh, this panel. Good to see you all again. Um, yeah, ready to go. <laughs> Talk about Scrappy. Awesome. Wendy. Hi, guys. I'm Wendy Bridge. I'm an artist and a 30-plus year Scooby-Doo collector. I am very excited that my friend Scrappy is joining us today. <laughs> And I'm very excited because I know that Cameron and Justin are part of my Scrappy squad. Let's go. Right there with you. Hey, Scrappy. Pro Scrappy. We love you, Scrappy. Look, even Trevor's got a little Scrappy. There I got go. him. There we go. There wasn't a lot of merch for Scrappy when I was younger. I never really saw anything. So. I would... And Cameron. Hi, I'm Cameron from Scooby-Doo and Cameron 2. Um, I'm a big Scooby-Doo collector and I've just been a big fan ever since big fan ever since I was a kid and I'm love Scrappy-Doo and I'm excited to talk today. Awesome. I'm excited to do this one. I think it's going to be fun, I hope. <laughs> uh, but before we get started, Wendy said that we needed a referee. So we have <laughs> one today. Oh my God! Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't we call that a moderator? Nice. If things get a little too heated, I'm just gonna put him up to the camera, and we're just <laughs> we're gonna all take a breath. <laughs> I don't think we'll need him, but just in case, just in case. <laughs> wow, I feel the okay. pressure now. Scrappy, Scrappy is not the most hated person on the panel anymore, now that we have that. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Flim <fun> Flam. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's very true. So we're going to start by talking about the origin of Scrappy. So Scrappy was created by Joe Barbera in 1978. And he was created to boost the ratings because ABC was threatening to cancel Scooby-Doo. Lenny Weinrib voiced Scrappy for the first season of the Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show. And then Don Massey took over. And then Scott Innes voiced Scrappy for the live action movie. Based on the episode Scrappy's birthday, Scrappy was born at St. Bernard's Memorial Hospital, which I think is hilariously funny. <laughs> he was born to Ruby Doo, who is Scooby's sister. And as soon as he was born, Trevor, you brought this up. He was walking, he was running, he was talking, and he just ran around the hospital causing trouble in typical Scrappy style. He was also trying to beat people up as soon as he was born. So hence the <laughs> karate Scooby shirt that I'm wearing today. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow he ended up growing up in New York where he had his own gang made up of himself, Annie, and Duke. And the show claims that he first met Scooby in the first episode, although Scooby and Shaggy were there for his birth. So that doesn't make any sense. So what is everybody, what was everybody's first impression of Scrappy? And Trevor, we're gonna start with you. Your oh, first impression of Scrappy. I feel my first impression. I think the first impression I got of him was when I watched the Nutcracker Scoob 
And actually, at that point, he, he didn't bother me. It's because everybody else was there too. And he added just a little extra spice to the mix and extra conversations between characters. So I had little idea what was in store. Justin, what was your first impression of Scrappy? Um, I was probably really little when I um, when I first watched anything with Scrappy in it. And I think like a lot of kids at the time, I loved him. Um, I thought he was funny. I mean, he was energetic and he was basically like a little kid. So I, you know, I guess I could relate with him. Um, and yeah, and I, I grew up watching a lot of those. I mean, I, I watched the originals obviously all the time and what's new Scooby-Doo um, growing up, but I did see a lot of those Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo on Cartoon Network and the movies that he was in. So I was always, I was always watching something that had Scrappy in it. So to me, it was always like a positive um, attribute to, you know, to have him around. So I love them. Wendy, how about you? Yeah, like Justin, Scrappy was honestly just part of my general Scooby experience as a, as a really young child. Obviously, like I was born in 86. So this is like early 90s that I was watching Scooby for like the first time and everything. And it was much more common to see episodes with Scrappy in them than even the very early classic ones. So like season three or the Scooby-Doo show and the ones with Scrappy, I just, that's what I was watching primarily. And it was so intermixed that I don't, I don't ever recall thinking like, oh, wow, why is Scrappy in some, but not others? And oh, the dynamic is really different. It, it never struck me like that because I was just consuming it all at the same time. And I never found it to be obnoxious you know like obviously there are characters in every series where you're like gee I kind of wish you were a little bit different or whatever um I never I never really thought much negative about Scrappy and probably mostly because I personally feel like all of those episodes that he was in I really enjoyed just the episodes too I thought they were really creative and fun whether it was with the rest of the gang or if it was just Shaggy and Scooby and Scrappy I really thought they were creative and imaginative. And so I just, I just overall enjoyed it. And I mean, he's a cute little puppy. Something wrong with you. If you hate him, look how cute he is. <laughs> <laughs> like Cameron petting his Scooby in his truck. The other oh night. my God. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and cuddle my Scrappy. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what she's talking about, we did a Courage the Cowardly Dog little panel oh, and yeah, and I'm just sitting there with this plush Scooby Doo, just like casually petting him, not even yeah. thinking of anything. And I'm just like, what a freak, Cameron. <laughs> what a freak. So, yes, that's it was me. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cameron, what was your first impression of Scrappy? So, I brought my holy Bible in case things get a little uh, crazy <laughs> today. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I love Scrappy Doo so much. So I made the Ten Commandments of Scrappy. I'm going to read them. It'll take one minute and then I will tell what I thought of Scrappy. So these are the Ten Commandments of Scrappy. Number one, thou shalt not put Scrappy down in hatred. Number two, thou shalt not put any puppies before him except a pup named Scooby Doo. You can, that's allowed. Uh -huh. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of Scrappy in vain. And number four, thou shalt keep his cartoon and name clean and pure. And number five, uh, thou shalt honor thy uncles and aunts the way that Scrappy honors Scooby and is loyal to his uncle Scooby. And number six, thou shalt not hurt or taketh, or, oh, excuse me, thou shalt not hurt or talketh of any hurting of an innocent puppy. Number seven, thou shalt always be faithful to the franchise and include Scrappy and in Happy Talk. So if you're like, you know, on a date, you'd be like, oh, I really love Scrappy Doo. Like that's, that's important. <laughs> Number eight, thou shalt not steal the thunder of this puppy. He's a happy puppy. Leave him alone. Number nine, thou shalt be truthful of Scrappy. And if it's mean, then you can pray for, um, for forgiveness. And then uh, number 10, uh, puppy power. So that's all I have for the two commandments. Amen. I'm going to send Amen. those to you all. So. Awesome. Uh, no. What version is this? <laughs> the new Cameron standard? Yeah, this is um, the Cameron version. Um, 
<laughs> no, but seriously, guys, I, I really like Scrappy. Um, I, I Like I said, when I was a kid growing up, I always saw Scrappy-Doo on TV. I remember waking up and watching the Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show. Um, you know, he's, he's received a lot of hate over the years. I've never hated him. I've never disliked him. I always thought he was this brave, fun, loving puppy. And I know from most cartoons, when people are watching him, you know, people are like, always oh, annoying or he's always running into well if you guys actually watch the series he's actually really loving i love that he's loyal to his uncle scooby i love that he's always supporting mystery incorporated i love that he's always just there when you need him and he's always there to help um and so like i said I, i've always loved uh scrappy um so yeah i think he's always been a good character and a great great nephew i i think they couldn't have written him or drawn him or brought him into the franchise any better Oh, I think they could have. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I, I myself have drawn him better. <laughs> my my first impression of Scrappy was that he was annoying and a bully and he liked to target innocent people and it just wasn't right. So that is my impression of him. We'll get into in a little bit, we'll get into my reasons, you know, more in depth as to why I don't like Scrappy. Um, I, I watched Scrappy pretty much for the past 24 hours, and after this panel, I definitely feel like I need to cleanse my brain because I've <laughs> overdone it with Scrappy. <laughs> oh my god. Man, poor Scrappy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be a fun one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three on two. All right. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, I couldn't have everybody loving Scrappy. It just wasn't yeah. going to work, you know? Yeah. So. Got to keep it interesting. That's huh? right. <laughs> so we have no idea who Scrappy's dad is. Has there ever been any kind of speculation as to who it could be? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't think what? they've ever. None that I looked into. Right. No. Yeah, I tried to look some stuff up, but I didn't find anything. And do we know, I mean, at the beginning of the Scooby and Scrappy Doo show, Scrappy is literally thrown off a train in a box at Scooby's feet. And it's like, okay, like now he's here and I guess I have to deal with him. But do we know at what point he lived in New York and had these friends? No. You know, I don't think there was ever really a set timeline for Scrappy. You know, I think it was just, I, I think the intro was just me, um, made to be really fun and loving. I really don't think it really played into a story. You know what I mean? Because like you watch some of the Scooby-Doo intros, you know, some of them are just made just to be an intro. They're not really put into the, the series or the movie or the story of Scooby-Doo. I think it was more along the lines of, you know, Scrappy was born um, from Ruby-Doo. And from there, you know, he was just, he just joined Mystery Incorporated. You know, going back into the franchise of Scooby-Doo, some things weren't actually explained. You know, it really wasn't talked about in the series where Coolville was in the United States. It wasn't really, you know, explained in the series, you know, about, I don't know, like, you know, uh, Fred and, and Daphne and Velma's parents or, you know, our Shaggy's parents or, you know, it really didn't explain all that. Now, I know as we go along, like Mystery Incorporated and other shows like that, there were, you know, they kind of explain some things here and there. But I felt like as in the earlier cartoons where Scrappy was, I just kind of felt like they kind of told the story of, you know, he was in New York, he had a gang and, you know, he, you know, he was a, he was a, a do good puppy. He always wanted to help people. And then he joined Mystery Incorporated. But I think it really didn't show where he joined along. I think it was just, you know, he was thrown in there and, you know, he made, he made it really fun. And so, like I said, I don't think it's really, a backstory to Scrappy. I think it's just more along the lines of, you know, how he came to be and, and you know, like I said, just how he fits in with Mr. Incorporated. Trevor, you look like you had something you wanted to say. I do. <laughs> I did a little Googling and the average litter for a Great Dane is six puppies. So where are the other five? And, uh, <laughs> And I feel like that's also a missed opportunity if they had animated a few siblings for him, um, characters they could have brought in later or um, some just cute interactions and then maybe him figuring out he didn't want to just be like his 
siblings and he wanted to go and have adventures or something. Um, I, I kind of don't like that there's the absent father thing that's just really sad in a weird way. And I get it was the mid 70s, perhaps they really were trying to make some things relatable for kids that didn't have two parents. But uh, I just thought that was just really odd. I did, and I just wish Ruby, if, if Ruby only had one that survived out of the litter, it seemed like she wouldn't want to let him go <laughs> that easy. Because again, Maybe like when he, when in the backstory, it looked like he was born, he was up and going, making trouble with them, and then he pleaded with her to send him off with them, and that's how it started. And then the retcon thing of him with his friends in New York is it's odd that they gave him odd. a story yeah, about very being odd in New for York. a cartoon story because it doesn't fit. I mean, if they were there for his birth, and then all of a sudden he's just like thrown at them, literally off the train. You well, know. and Scooby looks at him. It's like, who are you? Or Scrappy? <laughs> right. Like he looks scared of him. Right. And so because they make it seem like he's never. That was the first time that they met. But they met at his birth. Like he was running around the hospital with them. So. Well, I think it, it could just be that he hasn't seen him in a long time, and maybe the disconnect is just coming from the fact that because they wanted to keep him as a puppy-sized dog in the cartoon. He looks the same on the day he was born to us as he does when Scooby meets him again when he comes off of the train. And so I feel like if you had an aunt or an uncle that saw you the day you were born, and then five years later, having not seen you, they might be like, who are you? And you'd say, oh, well, I'm your I'm your nephew, I'm your niece, and they'd be happy, you know? So I think that that's more along the lines of that, you know, Scrappy's been off in New York, you know, he gets born, Shaggy and Scooby meet him, he goes and starts having a bit of a life. I mean, Great Danes only lived to be like seven years old, so if Scrappy's no, five years old, he's so already old, you know, if we're going to get technical about it. Right. So then, you know, he meets up with Shaggy and Scooby and they haven't seen him in a while, so it's, you know, um, but I will say, though, that I do think that this is why we need to remember, like it's fine to talk about stuff, but we do need to remember that children when they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 years old, really don't care about where their cartoon character came from, right. how many puppies should have been in the litter. You know, they're yeah. like, I want to watch these guys do something silly and fun and I want to just enjoy myself. So yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with us discussing it from a more adult viewpoint, but I'm pretty sure that when they were making all of these shows, I mean, any show we could take it and pick it apart and be like, well, that doesn't make sense. And neither does that. And this is right. making me not enjoy it. But when you were like five years old, I really don't think that you cared. You know, right. yeah. it didn't matter to you where any of that stuff came from. You're just like, wow, a new cartoon or wow, a new scrappy series mm -hmm. or whatever. And you're just going to enjoy it for what it is. And so I feel like if as adults, we could maintain that kind of mindset, yeah. we could keep enjoying Scrappy. <laughs> you know? And hey, he got thrown off the train in a box. <laughs> Sounds like a gift from God to me. <laughs> well, but my point though too, puppies change a lot in three or four weeks. And I get the age thing. We talked about it before about the kids staying frozen. But you know, when you're 15 and 16 to 19, you can kind of control your youth a little bit. Whereas a puppy a month or two away, I would have liked to have seen Scrappy like a little big as a bigger puppy than just a tiny, tiny puppy. Kind of like the size he was on a pup named Scooby-Doo. Kind of the gangly paws and, you know, the, the kind of, you know, over and tumble kind of doggy too, you know, an older puppy. Well, did anybody ever consider that maybe Scrappy's dad was a Chihuahua? <laughs> I mean, as long as you're not going the other way, it would work. Yeah, you never know. You're right. Yeah, that's true. He maybe, could have another. Uh... Maybe that's why he's so small. And I mean, Chihuahuas, they they don't look a whole lot different from when they're teeny tiny to when they're, you know, full that's grown. True. Some yeah. of them are quite small and they they don't have like if we can call them features. Their features don't don't change a whole lot right. like a larger breed of dog, which yeah, that's they true. look like a lot of dogs. 
they're super duper cute when they're puppies and then they grow up and you're like, oh, you're not, you're not that cute after all, you know, you were cute when you were little, but your facial features have changed and you're just not so cute anymore. Uh, Scrabby is perpetually cute. Didn't that, yeah, didn't Velma say mind. that was the glandular disorder though? <laughs> you know maybe maybe um uh, like i know that shaggy and scooby were present at his birth and um as, as they highlighted in uh scrappy's birthday but maybe maybe like when we're seeing the original intro when he gets thrown off the, the train maybe that's like him coming back from new york you know i mean i know that i know that uh the intro was before that was the original the half hour series but I don't know. I mean, it's just a fan theory, I guess, but maybe that's him coming back from New York and, you know, Scooby hasn't seen him in a while and they're throwing him off yeah. the train. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it really piques my interest though, because here's my thing, you know, Hanna-Barbera, but we're talking before, you know, Cartoon Network, Warner Brothers, Hanna-Barbera was meant to be fun and silly and, you know, these, these fun cartoons. And I felt like they did a great job with every cartoon they've done. And you watch some of these Hanna-Barbera cartoons, whether it be the Flintstones, Jetsons, Magilla Gorilla, whatever you watch, some of them don't have backstories. But I noticed a lot of people get so angry when they don't have a clear story of Scrappy-Doo. And I think to myself, well, maybe it was just like you said, he, you know, he, and I like Justin's theory. He was in New York. He was in a box. The train maybe hit a bump or whatever. And he would have, you know, fallen out of the train in the box and say, hey, Uncle Scooby. And then like Wendy said, he hasn't seen Scrappy in a while. There it is. But I just don't understand. I guess where I don't understand is why people get so butthurt while <laughs> Scrappy Doo doesn't have, yes, I'm sorry, why Scrappy Doo doesn't have an origin story, but yet all the other Hanna Barbera cartoons, some of them don't have origin stories. But everybody's okay with that. But as, if it comes with Scrappy Doo, and I don't know if it's just because some people hate him and they want to know everything about him so they can have more reasons to hate him, you know, which is really silly to me. But I'm just, I, I mean, because Wendy, when you started talking about, you know, yes, he's just a cartoon puppy. When kids watch him, you know, they want to, to love that puppy. And, and what's, a, what's a, a feature of Scrappy? He's a smaller Scooby in, in the franchise. You know what I mean? He's a small, tough, cute puppy, you know? And maybe on down the road in the franchise, maybe they'll make a, an adult version of Scrappy. You never know. You know what I mean? But I think where it comes along the line is, is that, you know, Scrappy in the earlier series from 1979, he was more of a puppy. And as he gets older, yes, his body type and everything stays the same, but I kind of saw Scrappy in a way mature. Now, some people may disagree with me, but I really did see him mature. You watch him in the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. You watch him on the Ghoul School. You watch him on Boo Brothers. He takes on more of a role where he is a leader, and yet he is more mature as a puppy. And so I, that's why I respect Scrappy a lot, because I'm thinking to myself, yes, he had that cute puppy phase, and yes, he wanted to rock him, sock him. But then as he gets older and stuff like that, and more of those series, he wasn't really all rambunctious and, hey, you know, I want to add him. And you got to think about it, guys. Scrappy-Doo is a puppy. Puppies are very brave. They're very loyal, and they want to go after something. You think about it. Puppies always want to go into get into trouble, and that's what Scrappy-Doo does. And then people are like, I don't like Scrappy-Doo because he's annoying, and he goes and gets in trouble. That's what puppies do. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, puppies aren't just going to sit there and, and, you know, just be quiet and silent and, you know, like Scooby. Like, you know, so as we go through the series and stuff like that of Scooby-Doo and Scrappy, or Scooby, Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo show, Scooby-Doo's more calm, reserved. He's a full-grown dog. Scrappy's more, you know, let me at him, you know, puppy power, and he's running, and he's running these situations because he's a puppy. Some people don't, are not clicking that, you know what I mean? So that's where I have to, like, I have to stop and say, okay, hold on now. We're talking about a puppy. I can see him more, mature more, you know, and I don't know where y'all stand on it, but, I mean, that's where I kind of see him fall along the spectrum. I do agree with you that he matured as as he got older yeah um in boo brothers like they needed him in boo brothers he was right. the one that was figuring out all the clues without exactly. him you know scooby and shaggy would never have gotten anywhere exactly so yeah i i definitely agree that he matured and he was easier to handle in those movies mm -hmm. than he was in the beginning I think that's where yeah. he was best uh, represented in those three movies, Cool School, mm -hmm. Reluctant Werewolf, Boo Brothers. And you're right, in yeah. Boo Brothers, I mean, well, in all of them, really, he was kind of like, 
it's, it was almost kind of like he took on the role of Vilma, like in his own way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. especially in Boo Brothers with cracking the, the, um, oh, what were it? like the codes or the, mm -hmm. whatever they were going to find. Uh, yeah, he was, he was kind of like Vilma. And I always remembered that with those three movies. And I, and I loved how he was represented. Um, even in the 13 ghosts, like to yeah. a lesson extent but yeah you're right he just took on a, a whole different that's life. because this guy was that's more true. annoying than scrappy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so what i mean this is probably getting off topic here but what does everybody i guess really quick what do you all think of uh flim flam <laughs> definitely more annoying than scrappy yeah he yeah. was he was a tough one older in return to or the, the yeah whatever years. it is um yeah. <laughs> he it was better he him being yeah. older was better but original flim flam no mm -hmm. he made scrappy look good yeah he definitely <laughs> did i also i hated his little songs that he would break out in at least i remember one in particular i don't even remember it was when they were in was, was it egypt or you know what i'm talking about when they're on the stage at the end mm -hmm. of the one episode i don't know he, he breaks out in the song and i just i don't usually I I usually don't dislike things with Scooby Doo, but man, I remember watching that and I was like, I like that series. I love the 13 Ghosts of Scooby Doo, but I, <laughs> I hated that. Can you sing it for us, Justin? I, I, I will not sing that, that Cameron. Yeah. I will I'm not sing that. I'm going to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I like Flame Flame in a way. You know, I thought it was cool they brought on a different character. Was he annoying? And I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with y'all. Yes, he was annoying in certain situations. You know what I mean? I always felt like he was trying to take the center stage away from the show. You know, um, I liked him in the in the thir the thirteenth the Curse of the Thirteenth Ghost the movie. I felt like he matured more. Um, you know, but you have to think about it though, you know, he came from a different part of the world, you know, he was always trying to deal, always trying to, you know, trade and, you know, always getting into, you know, trouble and stuff like that. Um, and I kind of felt like, in a way, that's why him and Scrappy got along well. And you always saw him and Scrappy kind of always team up and do little things here or there, you know, and I kind of felt like it was, you know, Scrappy was a puppy. And, you know, the Scooby, Scooby Doo and Scrappy Doo show. And kind of in a way, Flim Flam was a young kid. You know what I mean? And kids are kind of goofy and trying to express themselves. So I kind of felt like Scrappy was a bit of a mentor to Flim Flam in a way. And people may disagree with me, but you, you watch him. Like when Scrappy Doo was walking, Flim Flam was following him. Or, you know, Scrappy Doo would take the lead on some of the episodes in Flim Flam. And like I said, was Flim Flam annoying? Yes, he was. But he was a kid. What Scrappy do? Was he annoying on some episodes? And I will say, I love Scrappy, but he was a little annoying on some episodes. So was Shaggy and Scooby on some things. I mean, it's just cartoon characters. They get annoying here and there. It, it's just the way they are. But like you said, you got a kid and you got a puppy. What are kids and puppies? Sometimes they can be annoying. Sometimes they can be rambunctious. Sometimes they can try to steal a spotlight. That's what they are you know, but people hold them such higher standards, say, no, they must be calm, and they must be this, and I'm thinking to myself, that's just not the way that Hanna-Barbera had them to be, they had them to be fun and silly, and to put a smile on a kid's face, and yet I know we are five adults on this panel talking about it, and actually going in depth, but it's like what Wendy said, it's a cartoon, y'all, Hanna-Barbera was my favorite cartoon studio i mean when i saw the rainbow of hanna barbera come over and i mean it made me smile as a kid because it was just such fun cartoon ideas you know I, i'll be honest with y'all if bill hanna and joseph barbera were still alive to this day i think they would be very very upset for for the way james gunn portrayed him in the in the 2002 movie and i think they'd be very upset to see how the, he is not still a part of the franchise I really do. And those are two people I wish I could have met in my life. I was a young kid when they passed away, or maybe they passed away before I was born. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember when they passed away. But that's why they created cartoons, to make fun, to make laughter, to bring a joy, you know, a smile to people's face. And I've been on a panel with, with you four before, and y'all have each told me that when y'all watch Scooby-Doo, it makes you happy. Y'all collect Scooby-Doo. I know all four of you do. I do. It makes us happy. What did Bill Hanna and Joseph Barbera want to do with their studios? Make people happy. So I feel like when Scrappy-Doo and Flim Flam or whatever these characters that aren't the most popular on screen, 
they're just trying to make you laugh, put a smile on your face. But then you get some certain people that want to drag their name through the mud and then they ruin the character. You know, I mean, when I watch Scrappy Doo, I don't, I don't think of any hate. I mean, honestly, when I watch the Scooby Doo series, I mean, I guess I'm, I guess I'm very plain in that way. I, I don't look at hatred towards any Scooby Doo characters, really. I really don't. Um, is there certain series I like more than others? Yeah. Is there certain characters I like more than others? Heck yeah. You know, but I just, I feel like when you have a puppy named Scrappy Doo, you have a kid named Flim Flam. You got a dog named Scooby Dumb. You got a dog named Scooby D. You got all Scooby's family. You got these characters that they drop in. Fans love them, and you don't use them for the rest of the franchise. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I think as fans watch this panel, I think they will agree with me. You know, I I know in the Scooby community, people want to see more Scrappy. People want to see more Scooby Dumb, and they want to see more Scooby D. They do. They just do. You know. Um, but, you know, and like I said, fingers crossed for Scrappy making more appearances in the future. I mean, like you said, Nikki, we see more of his merchandise be released every day. Keychains or water bottles or handbags or whatever. And now Scrappy, I feel like, is taking back his name. He's, he's making a comeback, and I think he should. And for the people that wrote that awful bumper about him on Cartoon Network, for people that, uh, I mean, I, I'm... I guess I'm blaming James Gunn in a way and whoever else had their hands dipped in making Scrappy the bad guy. And, you know, I will say when Scott, when Scott Ennis wanted to voice Scrappy, he disagreed with the way they wrote Scrappy. They did. He did, you know, and he still voiced him because he had a great opportunity. And do I blame Scott for, for, you know, taking on the opportunity? No, I think if any of us were had the opportunity to voice a character and they still wrote the character bad, I think any of us would take it. You know, I do because it's an awesome opportunity. But yet Scott felt like they they wrote him bad. He was such a cute puppy on the 2002 Scooby-Doo movie. The way they made him, you know, I mean, he was just so cute. And I thought- I don't my, know, man. He he peed on Daphne. That's not cute. <laughs> no, it's but not. see, they wrote that. And they wrote that in there to make him look bad. And that's, I just, you know, and then, you know, they made him to this big giant monster at the end. Spoilers for any of y'all. I'm sorry. Oh, it's since 2002. But <laughs> they made him into this big monster and then they, they shunned him away. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what they should have done? They should have made a Scooby-Doo 3 movie and it should have been where there was something so terrible happening that Scooby had to get together everybody to, to solve this or whatever the plot was. And he would have gone back and he would have had that connection with Scrappy. And he would have said, you know, Scrappy, I mean, I'm not going to talk like Scooby on the way, but, but Scooby would have talked to Scrappy and said, I'm your uncle. You're a puppy. You're learning. You're growing. You need to, you know, and then Scrappy would have, you know, got back in sync and that's him and Scooby would have teamed up. But here's my thing, though. They completely just butchered the relationship that scooby and scrappy had with each other on the movie it wasn't like it wasn't even existent i mean scooby was rolling his eyes in the back of the mystery machine when scrappy was like i'm gonna you're gonna make me my leader and stuff like that i'm thinking to myself scooby didn't act like that in the original cartoon scooby loved scrappy he had, they had a, such a great connection and i guess that's where i favor because i have a nephew right now i have such a great connection with him for this past Halloween, we dressed up as Scooby and Scrappy, and people loved it because I know that Scooby and Scrappy have a great relationship. Why would you want to butcher that? What, so you can make some money or you can make a joke out of it? I think I think he was wrongly done in 2002 movie, and I think that's what um, what kind of you know run his name through the mud. And I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm talking a lot, but I'm just saying this is where this is how I feel. I feel like he's been wrongly done, and I think he needs to make a good comeback. I think he was done like that on purpose because I think that at that time there was a lot of scrappy hate and I think that's what they felt that people wanted to see. Yeah. Um, but we'll get more into more detail about that in a little bit. Wendy, what are your thoughts on Flim Flam? We're going to go back to that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to be honest. I think that Flim Flam suffered from the same problem if Scrappy had a problem, I think Flim Flam suffered from the same one, and that was bad voice acting. Because the original Scrappy episodes, while the episodes themselves are wonderful, I'm sorry, Lenny Weinrib was not a good choice 
to voice that character because his voice stylings alone made Scrappy into, he was annoying. He was annoying in some of those early episodes, you know? I, like like Cam said, he's a puppy and they were quite realistic as far as, you know, following like what would a real puppy do? It doesn't do what it's told. You tell it, you know, sit down, stay there. And then you walk off and the stupid thing follows you everywhere. You know, like real puppies do that. So I understand why they went about doing that with their cartoon Scrappy as well. But I just think that that voice was so wrong. It gave him such an aggressive feel that I don't think was appropriate for the character because the reason that I like, I really don't mind if people don't like characters, you know, if that doesn't change my ability to enjoy them, you know, at all. So if like there's characters and things that I don't like either, and I don't want somebody telling me, well, you have to like what I like. No, I don't. And you don't have to like what I like, but I do feel like they're getting too hung up on the voice because if you do go further on when Don Messick takes over and just Don Messick's voice alone is enough to like take it down a couple of notches you know Scrappy still gets everybody into trouble sometimes you know he's very headlong uh, headstrong he's very zealous in what he wants to do all the way through and that's part of just his style, his character, you, you know what I mean? And I think it would be wrong of us to be like, well, I don't like that, change it. Well, but that is kind of the point of what he was supposed to be, like a juxtaposition between Scooby. And the beauty, I think, of Scrappy, which this is why I don't, I don't like when people do too much criticizing of that character, like ruining Scooby or something. Scrappy is Scooby's number one fan. Okay, oh, that's Scrappy... True does nothing except bolster Scooby. He's like, you are amazing. I love you. You're my hero. You're so brave. Even when Scrappy saves the day, Uncle Scooby did it. Mm-hmm. Uncle Scooby did it. So you know, he, it reminds he learned me- everything from his Uncle Scooby. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it reminds me so much of another cartoon that I really, really love, which was Inspector Gadget in the 80s. Inspector Gadget is a bumbling moron. And let's, like, I'm sorry to say it like this. I'm probably going to take some heat for it. But in in a way, Scooby and Shaggy are bumbling idiots, too. They are. We love them. But, you know, they're afraid all the time. They don't want to do stuff. It, they need help from the others. Just as much as the others need help from them. And in Inspector Gadget, Gadget thinks that he solves all of the, the, you know, what's going on, captures the mad agents when really it's Penny and Brain doing everything. They never come out and like, well, excuse me, Uncle Gadget, I actually am the one that solved this and stopped mad agents and saved your life five times in the last three hours. They never do. They just stand back and they watch as Chief Quimby congratulates Gadget and you know, and it's it's wonderful. And that's how I see Scrappy with Scooby. I think that people neglect the relationship. And this ties into what something that Cam said, which, and we'll talk about the movie later on, but changing that dynamic between Scrappy and Scooby was an absolute travesty. That was not appropriate, whether you like the character or you don't. It's got nothing to do with that because Scrappy was always a positive force as far as Scooby-Doo, his uncle, his hero was concerned. Scrappy would have done anything for Scooby and Scooby would have done anything for Scrappy. Mm -hmm. When Scrappy gets too excited and he he runs off, Scooby's got to go save him. So I kind of feel like the two characters, and I I personally believe that this was what they, they meant for this to be, Scrappy gives courage to Scooby, not just by saying, you know, I learned all this from you. I look, excuse me, I look up to you. But also Scooby is now showing bravery when he sees that Scrappy is in trouble. That's my nephew. He's going to get hurt. I don't care that I'm afraid. I have to go and get him. Mm -hmm. Whereas in earlier classic Scooby-Doo, Scooby needs to be bribed 
Well, would you do it for a Scooby snack? Oh, you pay three Scooby snacks, you know, or tell him he's like John Wayne, still one of my favorite moments in all classic Scooby-Doo, you know yeah. what I mean? Like John Wayne and off he goes. Um, but when it comes to Scrappy, Scooby doesn't need any kind of false courage or any kind of bolstering. He is just there because Scrappy's his family and he loves him. And I think that that was the dynamic that they were going for. So long story to get back to Flim Flam. <laughs> Once Scrappy was voiced by Don Messick, completely changed the character. And I think that if the Lenny Weinrib era had never existed, I don't think we'd be sitting here having this conversation. I don't think that the hate for Scrappy would have existed. Would there be people that didn't enjoy him being added to the show? Absolutely. Absolutely. The same as there are people that don't like when Fred and Daphne or Velma get dropped from a show. You know what I mean? They want their, their core characters and that's understandable. But if that just such an aggressively aggravating voice had never been attached to the character, I don't think there would be that hate. And when I think of Flim Flam and yeah, he was because of how he grew up. I mean, the character I think is meant to be a little bit obnoxious, but I really think that the voice acting was just wrong, 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 wrong. It just brought me right back to that original voice for Scrappy where I'm like, I can't stand how you say how you sound. So I don't care what you're doing. I don't want to watch you. And so I think that that Flim Flam also got done dirty by the voice acting casting. I, if, I, if I think back to different episodes from 13 Ghosts and Flim Flam doing something, like a scene with him in it, and I picture it with like any other voice, even like Nikki said too, I really didn't like that that movie. Um, yeah, I don't even know what it's called. Curse of the 13th Ghosts. Curse Ghost of the 13th Ghosts, yeah. 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 I actually, I didn't really like that movie. But agree 100%, Flim Flam in that movie, there was nothing obnoxious about him. He was actually quite an enjoyable character. I, I enjoyed that aspect of that film. And so if I imagine, like I know he's younger in 13 Ghosts in the series, but I just like any other voice I feel like would have been, like imagine Flim Flam's voice for Penny. Because I'm pretty sure it was a woman that voiced Flim Flam, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that voice actor doing Penny in Inspector Gadget, and I guarantee you, I would have hated that show with that if Penny's if Penny had sounded like that. So I think Flim Flam is not a bad character, and I don't even think that he necessarily should have been as annoying as he was. Was he annoying? Absolutely, yes, but bad voice casting, in my opinion, just not wasn't good. Ever, what are your thoughts on Flim Flam? Um, I don't, I don't, uh, when I finally saw 13 Ghosts, it might have been after I saw Indiana Jones, but I just thought a short round and it's like the same great, mm -hmm. super cute. uber cute little person just almost saying the exact wrong things, knowing like they have a vibe knowing what makes an adult cringe. I mean, I think sometimes it's innocent and it's, it's um, you know, they don't mean to, but I mean, you know, like if you've ever babysat or, or have you had the kids and then they ask you the same question five different ways and you're trying to tell them about the sky being blue or, or why this tree looks different. And then, you know, even my grandly patient self, you just kind of get a little bit like this. That's how <laughs> Flim Flam was for me. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on to why is Scrappy disliked by so many? So one of the things that I did yesterday was I put up some polls to find out if people really don't like Scrappy if, or if they do like Scrappy. I put a poll on Twitter and two on different Facebook pages. So what I put up was the, the choice is, I love him, I hate him, and eh, he's okay. I was surprised that eh, he's okay, got 46% because 
because I've always felt like people either love Scrappy or they hate that hate him, but there is no in between. Hmm. And apparently that's not true anymore. Maybe it was like that back when you know they did the live action movie, but yeah, forty six percent said he's okay. Twenty six percent said I love him. Twenty percent said I hate him. And then some people added some other choices and I'll just read the other choices. They're, they're like 2% and under, so they don't, they aren't like super important, but we'll read them anyway. So somebody said, depends on the film or the show. Someone said, meh. Someone said, love to hate him. Created at the wrong time. Dislike and doesn't belong. So are you guys as confused by the poll results as I am? Because it, like I said, I really didn't feel like there was much in between with Scrappy. Justin? Um, I guess, I guess I'm not really surprised just because I feel like, like the fan base is very so divided, like right down the middle on, because I see so many people that absolutely love Scrappy. And then there's so many people that don't. So, I mean, I guess the, eh, if he's okay, is it, it doesn't surprise me that that was the number one, you know, answer to your poll. Um, you know, I feel like if they, were, if they were to bring back Scrappy, which I'm holding out that I'll be able to see that in my lifetime, <laughs> it's got to happen at some point. And I know it will. I mean, it has to. But if they even brought him back and just kind of like did what they did with uh, Flim Flam in, curse of the 13th ghost just make him make him a little more mature even if they made him like a little older you know i don't know i don't know what they were gonna do but there's a way to do it that maybe will appeal to everybody and i'm sure you're still gonna get those people that no matter what they do they're just gonna hate scrappy because they're on that train and they're never gonna get off so yeah, that's fine but um yeah so now i'm not really surprised by that answer because i just i talk to so many people every day online that <laughs> hate him and some that love him so well, we know that there's hope for people to like Scrappy because Trevor doesn't hate him as much as he used to. <laughs> well, I think, well, hate is a strong word. I have, I have my reasons. I mean, which we'll get to. How many yeah. hours are we into the 16 hours? Because <laughs> it really could go that far. I <laughs> Wendy, what are your thoughts on the poll results? I'm honestly, I'm not surprised at all because the fact of the matter is something that never changes. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And usually I find in life, not just with Scrappy, but with pretty much anything, it's always the people who want to hate on stuff, the people who want to be negative and miserable. They are the ones that flap the most. Mm -hmm. They flap the most. They flap the loudest. They are the ones out, you know, banging on the street, you know, listen to me, listen to me. I don't like this. Whereas I'm sitting there like, okay, if you don't like it, be quiet and find something that you do like. But I find that people will put so much effort into being negative towards a thing or to other people. They will put in so much time and effort to be negative. And they're just, it's like they want to be miserable. And if they're going to be miserable, well, then you should be miserable with them. And I personally don't, I don't like that kind of mindset, but I feel like that, that's the majority of people. I mean, it might be nice to think that, that it's not, but if you really stop and you take an objective look at life in general, that is the majority of people. They want to be miserable, whether they will admit to that or not, they don't I mean, I see this as like, I feel like Twitter is a really great place for people to be like angry. You know, I feel like every social media platform has like a type of interaction that it's most suited for or the most well known for. And I feel like on Twitter, people, they're not on there looking for accounts of something that they like. You know, I'm on there. I like art. I like Scooby. I like pop culture. I like old television shows. That's what I want to consume. You know, the one thing I hate about Twitter is that I can't turn the trending list off. And the trending list is just full of negative things that make me angry. 
And I'm like, my experience on this platform would be so much better if I didn't even have to see it. I don't want to see it because I don't need extra negativity in my life. I want to use social media to meet people like you, people that have similar likes and interests where when we sit down to talk, I mean, okay, yeah, we're talking about Scrappy and some of us like him and we don't. But the fact is, we're all going to shut off this call tonight and nobody's going to be mad at each other and no one's going to be like, oh, I, I hate Trevor. You're so full of it. Rip, rip. I mean, good grief. If that's if that's the kind of person that you are, like, settle down. <laughs> you know, there's just, there's, there's so much negativity that, and they go looking for it. That's the point. People yeah. go looking for things to complain about. So it does not surprise me at all that what we thought was a majority of people who like just flat out hate Scrappy, actually that's not the case. It's just that that little minority that despises him, they just can't shut up. They can't just go find something that they do like. They wanna just, you know, moan about it and stuff. And like I say, I feel like you could find that in every walk of life and for every topic and every television show and stuff. And I would just like to say to people like, settle down. Okay. There's enough negativity in the world. If you don't like something, move on and find something that you do like. And if other people like things that you don't like, don't try and steal their happiness. You know, let them be happy. Let if, you know, if Trevor and Nikki don't love Scrappy, like Cam and Justin and I do. So what? What difference does that make to anybody? You know, I, I I would be, what kind of a horrible friend would I be if I was like, you know what, Nikki and Trevor, you need to sit down and watch every single episode of Scrappy every day for the rest of your life or we can't be friends. Okay, number one, you'd be like, okay, bye. Go find some new friends is what you would do. And rightfully so. But that would be like what I would enjoy that. I would, Cam sent around a video today of some guy that watched like all 99 episodes of Scrappy. <laughs> I would absolutely love to sit down and watch all of the episodes of Scrappy. I would have no problem with that at all. Am I going to ask Nikki to come over to my house and do it with me? No, I'm not because that would be mean. I know that, that she's not that into it. So why would I ever try to inflict that? You know what I mean? Like if, if you want to come over, great. Let's find something that we both like equally, you know, or like, yeah something you like and something that I like but in like small doses you know what I mean um but this this stuff about like everybody's got to listen to your griping about what you don't like no we don't want to listen to you gripe okay you're entitled to your opinion we all are but like stop being so loud about it because I'm sorry you are the minority you are not the majority as the poll has now proven because that meh either way that is not, I hate Scrappy. That is either I grew up without Scrappy and I don't love the dynamic of a changed up gang, which I totally understand. I have no trouble like thinking about the logic behind that. If I had not grown up with all of it kind of integrated together, I might feel the same. I might be like, you know what? I really prefer. And well, that's, hey, that's the truth. I do prefer when it is just the gang. The Scrappy is not my favorite you know, when he's in it, because it, it does change the dynamic. I do prefer the classic mysteries and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, guys, you're scrappy haters, like take a back seat. Okay, we're calling you out. <laughs> you're the minority. And we've had enough of you well, acting like you're the majority. Okay, scrappy is here to stay. And if you don't like him, <laughs> go find yourself another cartoon. But we are going to sit here <laughs> and we're going to love on him and we're going to talk about him until the end of time. The end. Yeah, oh, I guess that's it. it for us, Trevor. I guess we got to go. <laughs> All right, I'll shut the panel down early. I just, I don't, I, this is another section of talking about. Um, and this was the last panel that Wendy was ever seen on. <laughs> no, I thought I'll be the one that's mysteriously never invited for any more. Um, uh, Trevor, what are your thoughts on the poll results? I'm just, I'm a little surprised, but in the end, it makes sense. Cause in a weird way, even the meh, it's like, so everything's evenly, mm -hmm. like you've got a kind of a 50, 50 of the world, you know, I mean it, and um, no, it doesn't surprise me. Um, 
the, the, the uh, world is active. like very small the world is 484 people just well so you know. i mean the people at that time that chose to respond i <laughs> i i um I don't know. It, it's it's really interesting. It's like my I've never been online. I've never the, I have friends and, and we grew up on school. As I say, I I was two years old when it started. So that was all we knew. And then I have several good friends <laughs> that actually share my opinion of scrapping. It was never anything you had to cultivate or farm. It just happened. It, it uh, again, as things will bring up later, it wasn't necessarily for what scrappy was per se but it's what they got rid of, what the writers got rid of to make more room for what Scrappy offered, which is some of my problem with culture in general. It's like when you have real life thing where you have a group of friends and another friend comes along and charms half of them away and you're just going, what happened? We were all a team. Uh, things that, that vibe like that. And just in general too, like the, there's a thing called the Scrappy effect. And I looked into that. Um, like Will Wheaton on uh, the next gen, um, Jar Jar Binks, uh, some other things like things associated with these things that it, are characters introduced into properties to be specifically the young one, specifically to be the energetic one, specifically to be the cute one and not to be that one that is cute, but to be the cute one. Um, it's just with Scrappy, I, I very much felt like there's a certain way that they wanted us to see him and he didn't really get to evolve the way I wanted. So I, I get, but I've not actively cultivated a dislike. I just don't appreciate, especially as I get older, the thought of younger and cuter is always, always better. That's not the way life goes. And life should be lived at the spectrum of people, you know, young and old together, working together, celebrating er everything. So if you're always in the mood for the cutest little thing, I mean, and we could discuss too that a pup named Scooby Doo was introduced when Scrappy disappeared from the franchise, which basically meant Hanna Barbera decided to Scrappy eyes all of them. Think about that, all of them. All of them went <laughs> little. So, I mean, in a weird way, the Scrappy motif won that whole uh, paradigm they set up won for a while. So, so yeah, I mean, it's not really, I don't hate him, I just hate what american culture tends to do with that does that make sense and um and even a past like one of the pastors church talking about his marriage it's just popped in my mind that when they had kids when they were little and after they got old enough to be out of car seats that mom always sat in front with him because his relationship was her was the most important relationship and they were loved but the kids sat in the back like they weren't put above his relationship with his wife and not that that I've never really thought about it but then that's that's just cool so I've just viewed the gang as having this really special relationship and with Scooby and and as I said Nutcracker Scoob was really delightful and I watched half of it today I mean because it was chopped up but I had no trouble with him as a mix in. I had trouble when the writers and creators decided to think that we've got this younger, cuter dynamic. The rest didn't matter to us. So I'm sorry, I, I really went on too long. No, you're good. <laughs> Cameron, what are your thoughts on the poll results? You know, I I really am not surprised. And the reason I say that is, is because I know in the Scooby community, I've been seeing a lot of posts of Scrappy. When, and I started my page back in 2018. And, or excuse me, 20, 2018, 2019. And I saw so many posts of Scrappy. And I've been seeing more and more Scrappy come out and come above and, and do all that. Um, you know, I've, I've seen more merchandise be made of him. Um, and so to see the results saying, uh, you know, he's in between and then the second one that people liked him, those two were top leading. And the last one of the, of the three that you made, Nikki, was I hated him. And so that's actually really, and, and you post, I saw you when you post him, you posted in some big groups and a lot of people participated in those polls. You know, you had like thousands upon thousands of people in those groups right. on Facebook or wherever social media you had. Now, you know, I, 
you know, I, I see because your your initial question to us, Nikki, was, you know, what what why was Scrappy so disliked? And I have to agree with Wendy. I, that YouTube video that I sent y'all the day, um, I, I forget who it was from, but it was from this guy, and he did uh he watched all the Scooby Doo and Scrappy Doo shows, and he actually showed a clip of when Lenny Weinrib voiced Scrappy, and then when Don Messick voiced Scrappy. And Don Messick did a wonderful job. You know, Lenny Weinrib, he, he was actually good, but I felt like he, they could have used him in a different character or a different setting or, you know, something like that. Um, but Don Messick made him sound more of like a puppy. So, you know, I felt like maybe that's where it came off, of, um, you know, because maybe sometimes when Scrappy was trying to act like a puppy and sounding like an older dog, maybe that's where it kind of made some fans go, ooh, you know, maybe I don't see him in that sense. You know, we also bring up to, I know all of us have brought up the curse of the 13th ghost. One thing I did not like the most about that movie is Scrappy was not in it. And I also like the, I not like the comment. I also very much dislike the comment that was made on the, the curse of the 13th ghost where Velma go or Daphne goes, you know, this mystery was great. All we're missing is a Scrappy. And I think Daphne said it, or one of them said it. And then Velma goes, what's a Scrappy? I hated that so much. I, I literally paused the movie and I was like, are you kidding me? Like, why, why, why? And they did that. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I don't understand it. But then I kind of, and I'm not trying to go off track, Nikki, I'm just saying, but then I started thinking about it. Maybe that, that particular Scooby do was in a, in a, like in a different Scooby verse, like in a different multiverse. Because if y'all read the Scooby Doo 50th comic, where Scooby-Doo teamed up with all the multiple versions of himself, you saw Daphne, Shaggy, and Scooby uh, from The Curse of the 13th Ghost. So then I thought to myself, maybe maybe the game, maybe Fred and Velma did not meet Scrappy in that sense. But still, the producers made an effort to make sure Scrappy wasn't in there. You had Flim Flam, you had Vincent Van Gogh, you had the Chest of Demons. Where's Scrappy? I think that would have, I think that movie was the easiest way to bring him back into the franchise the easiest way and now you have to bring him back in another way and that, i'll be honest with y'all i don't know how they're going to bring him back because i think it's going to be harder now mm-hmm. unless they do a revisit to the boo brothers or they do some some kind of you know revisiting um you know i feel like and and wendy i'm going off a lot what you said because I love what you said. And I, another thing I love what you said is that Scrappy was Scooby's number one fan. He was always pumping him up. And here's the thing. You watch a lot of cartoons and usually the kids or the puppies or whatever, the younger characters on the show were always figuring out or solving the problem, whether it was a Disney show, whether it was a Hanna-Barbera show, they were the ones doing it. And then the adult character was taking the credit, but the kids knew that the kids were getting it done. The kid characters were getting it done. And I think that's kind of like how they were trying to portray Scrappy. But some people along the way took it as Scrappy's still in Scooby's Thunder. Well, no, 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 no. It goes back to what I was originally saying. Scooby and Scrappy have such an amazing bond. They really do. And I think they did that back then because back in the 80s, there was some research that was shown that, you know, some uncles and nephews didn't have the best relationships. So they were trying to show that whether you have it's a, a niece and an aunt or a, a, a niece and an uncle or a nephew and an aunt or a nephew and an uncle, that there is a special bond there. I have a nephew. I have a special bond with him. And I, and I know it sounds really silly, but I kind of think of it like in a Scooby and Scrappy sort of sense. My, my nephew's always getting into trouble. He's always running everywhere. He's always trying to, you know, he's caught, you know, he, he, that's, that's, what, that's what kids do. He's little. You know, and I'm always having to run and grab him and say, oh, no, no, you don't do that. Well, that's what Scooby did. You know, it showed that he was braver. Scrappy Doo brought out a better version of Scooby in my sense. And so I think that's where people got off disliking him. Bad voice acting. And mis mis uh, interpretation of how Scrappy was portrayed in a way. And I think that. When you did that poll, Nikki, I think it's showing that people want Scrappy Doo back. And I think that when they do bring him back, and and I'm with Justin because I don't want to be old and gray hair and a, and a mustache and a beard, be like, oh, I'm 80 years old and there's Scrappy on the screen. Oh my God, oh. No, I don't want to do that. Like I want to be like I want to be young and I want to be 
I think everybody wants to be young forever. But I'm just saying, like, you know, I want to see Scrappy make that comeback. I want to see Scooby-Doo make that comeback. Here's my thing, guys. You make those characters like Scrappy-Doo, and he does well. Or scooby Dumb, he does well. Scooby-D, she does well. And then, you know, you have them for a couple episodes or whatever, and then poof. And I know we're talking about Scrappy-Doo, and I, I promise I'm not trying to go off on another character, but look at Scooby-D, for example. She made it, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, y'all, but she made an appearance in one show, one episode, the Chiller Diller movie thriller. That's it. That's all she had. And I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? One episode? And she was such a great character. I mean, when I watch the Chiller Diller movie thriller from the Scooby-Doo show, when I get done with the episode, I'm going, oh my God, I want more Scooby-Doo. Now, I know she made a cameo in What's New Scooby-Doo, but still, it's like for some reason, the producers are not wanting to bring them in. And I honestly think that's what causes dislike with those characters. You know, when people watch, they're thinking to themselves, okay, the, the producers didn't bring them back. I don't like them. I don't like, because, you know, a lot of people follow what Warner Brothers does. Warner Brothers, they have the Scooby-Doo franchise in their hands, and they go one way with it. And a lot of people like to follow how Warner Brothers does something. So when Warner Brothers says, oh, we don't like this character, or we're going to take it and we're going to run with this, people follow. You know, and I'm not trying to get off on a different thing, but I will say, guys, in life, either you're a lion or you're a sheep. Are you going to lead? Or are you going to follow? You know what I mean? And I kind of feel like that's how people have been. They follow along and say, yeah, we dislike Scrappy. Why do you like dislike Scrappy? Well, um, I don't know. He was annoying. Yes, he was annoying here and there. But did you see the bond that he had with his uncle? Did you see how he was always pumping up Mystery Incorporated? Did you see all these great attributes that he had? To, and it's like people just throw those out the window. You know what I mean? And here's my thing. If people are just going to cut down Scrappy because he was annoying in a sense, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes Shaggy could have been getting into something and he could have been annoying from saying like a lot. You know what I mean? And like I told, like I said, in the very beginning of, of this, of this panel, there, we love our cartoon characters. We do. Do they do certain things sometimes and they get a little annoying? Yeah, they do. But that's what cartoon characters do. Do I do some things that are annoying sometimes? Yeah, I do. But here's the thing, though. Sometimes things are repetitive. Sometimes, sometimes things don't like to go off track. And so people don't like that. People want change 24-7. Well, sometimes that doesn't work out. Sometimes characters have to stay on a route. I felt like they've done good with staying on the route with Scrappy-Doo. Um, and some people may not like that. Some people say, well, make him change. I saw change from Scrappy-Doo, y'all. Like I told y'all, I saw him mature more as a puppy and I, I and in a way I kind of saw how he took Daphne Freddie and Velma and they combined it into to, to Scrappy because like Justin was saying Scrappy was kind of taken on in the movies he was kind of taking on detective skills like Velma he was kind of leading like Freddie and he was showing the charm like Daphne so I'm just saying that's where I kind of feel like people are you know disliking him and if, Nikki you look like you want to laugh but am I saying something that makes you laugh? <laughs> I have actual reasons to dislike him so <laughs> oh okay well there you go but but y'all know what I mean right. a lot of people do just say he's annoying and that's where they stop and yeah. you know they can't give you a reason right but there are there are reasons <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> um, you know I think right. really quick so I'll make this quick no, here but I'm now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I really think I remember reading that um, I believe his name is Tim Sheridan, who wrote uh, Scooby Doo: Curse of the Thirteenth Ghost. I think he said in his original idea for that movie, he wanted to have Scrappy Doo. That was a way to bring Scrappy Doo back. And I believe Warner Brothers did tell him they didn't want him in the film. They didn't even want Flim Flam in the film, but he begged them to get Flim Flam back in the way that he did. And I also think that I believe his name is uh, John Colton Barry. Uh, who created Be Cool Scooby-Doo. Um, I remember him saying, I think it was the Halloween episode, he had a, in the script that Scrappy-Doo was going to be in that episode. Now, of course, there would be the Be Cool version. I'm not sure if that would have been the way that we all wanted him to come back uh, properly or not, but I know that he was going to have that in there. And then last minute, he took it out because he didn't think that was the appropriate time to bring him back. But I mean, so obviously there's been some people that have 
at Warner Brothers that have wanted Scrappy Doo to come back. But I mean, like Cameron was saying, you can tell Warner Brothers knows exactly what they want with the Scooby Doo franchise, and that's just one thing as of right now, at least that we can tell that they just don't want that. And it's just like they don't want any any real monsters, any real supernatural. Because even in that Curse of the Thirteenth Ghost movie, I know we keep going back to that, and that's not what this is about. But I mean, if you're making a, a sequel to th- the Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby Doo, which was filled with magic and supernatural, that movie had none of it. And I think that's a clear representation of the direction that Warner Brothers is in right now with the Scooby Doo franchise. And I don't know. I think it's kind of irritating. I really do. I think it's because Scooby Doo is not just 1969 Scooby Doo. Where are you? Don't get me wrong. That's I love the original scooby-doo and that's you know made it what it is today but there's other elements to scooby-doo and scrappy-doo and even like the real supernatural you know uh, popping up here and there that's that's all a part of it at the end of the day so, so. Agreed. they should have brought scrappy back for curse of the 13th ghost i mean it would have been the perfect time for them to bring him back and and he was part of the 13 ghosts of scooby-doo so why wasn't he there Exactly. He should have been there. Yeah, that was a big disappointment. Um, and I liked, I liked the movie that, like, the story that they were telling to an extent. But yeah, that was, I was so disappointed when he wasn't in that. And like Cameron said, when Vilma made that comment, I was like, oh, this is, that's bad. <laughs> so we're going to get into some reasons why <laughs> Scrappy is not a good character. Oh my gosh. But first, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you one thing that I like about Scrappy. There's two. We've already covered it. It's that he's always, you know, praising Scooby and, and telling him, you know, that he he's so great and that he taught him everything that he knows. And, and uh, the other thing is that he always sees the positive in a bad situation. So, you know, anytime they're in trouble or something's happening like in um the scarab lives they were on the conveyor belt and it started moving and shaggy and scooby were like oh no we're moving and he's like that's okay because i can see the room better now you know so (laughs) so at least there's there's two positive things about scrappy that's it (laughs) other than other than he did mature later he did mature later so that's good too he didn't stay completely annoying forever (laughs) <laughs> tell us how you really <laughs> feel Nikki <laughs> I know she was like that's it too that's I, thought, I thought I was <laughs> alone here I thought I was alone I'm getting there <laughs> so so one of the things that really bugs me is that he uses his catchphrases way too much way too much I mean all I have in my head from watching these scrappy shows is his catchphrases and it's driving me crazy he definitely uses them way too much. He is a bully. He is a bully. He calls people names all the time. He attacks innocent people. Like he's dragging some guy across the floor and they're like, that's not him. And he's like, well, I'm just a puppy. No, there's. it's never okay to attack innocent people, Scrappy, never. <laughs> Puppy or not, not okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, those are, those are my main getting, reasons. Nick. What was that, Cameron? I, said, I love how heated you're getting. Do we need flim flam? Somebody need to hold him yeah, up for me. Let me grab my Bible real quick. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh. And then besides that, like his voice, Lenny, Lenny Weinrib, I just didn't feel that the the voice was good. And maybe it I would not have felt this way, but even if Don Messick voiced him and well, even in Boo Brothers and, and Ghoul's Hole and the movies, he's calling people names. And you know that that's it's just not okay, Scrappy. You can't call people names. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Trevor, <laughs> why do you dislike Scrappy? <laughs> well, do we... Okay, here's where the next 15 hours go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, well, I'm teasing. Um, 
Well, I've already addressed one thing. It's like from a perspective of a child kid viewing it or an adult looking back at, at what happened. I love Fred. I love Velma. I love Daphne. I love the mix of them. I felt like it proved that kids of different kinds could like get along and really like each other. I mean, it made my heart feel good. So that when Scrappy came and then, I mean, I read, or one of the videos talked about the voice actor for Velma during that time was sick. So she couldn't be in it. So then the producers finally got the idea, oh, we can let Scrappy take these parts on. And then they just didn't, you know, hire the voice actors for the other shows. So my adult side, knowing that now, makes me forgive Scrappy a little more because it wasn't his fault that they didn't hire the voice actors and bring the characters in. But my little kid self just noticed they were gone. So no explanation. So like the mummy episode I saw, it was a real mummy, a real ghost. And, and why, I mean, Mystery Machine is Fred's joy. Why, why does Shaggy drive it? Um, and then um, wouldn't they like want to get in touch with Velma afterwards to say, oh my goodness, we had real encounters. That's the other thing too, because Velma was always such a skeptic. And, you know, since they were close, I figured all those true monsters and stuff, it should trickle back in. And that would have been a wonderful gateway to grow Sc Scooby up into that realm of the ghosts are real too. So that was a missed opportunity. Uh, the voice thing um, bothers me, um, and this would be the time I'd bring out, I, I think I mentioned it on our chat um, on Instagram, but Iwo Takamoto thought that Henry Hawk would be a perfect idea for a Scrappy. Now, if you've ever seen that character, he's small, he's feisty, very strong, but his goal is to kill and eat Foghorn Leghorn. And he's always on his case, <laughs> always chasing around to the point you want Foghorn Leghorn to kind of club him in the head. Um, clearly a, a little guy that just doesn't know when to stop, you know, because that's literally, he couldn't fit all of Foghorn into his mouth anyway. So um, <laughs> Scrappy always felt like that to me. Um, and the other thing going with that, I don't know if you're familiar. I think there was a character called Little Audrey or something. There was like a little baby in a Warner Brothers cartoon or something uh, where the crux was there was a loving dog that was watching the baby and the baby went out the window and then went out on the building and, and on the girders and the dog was having a nervous breakdown following the little baby through her things. And I viewed a puppy like Scrappy getting into the trouble to be saved, but doing it not as a willful act, but just kind of more as an osmosis thing. And sometimes Scrappy, literally after you're looking and you're seeing the danger, he's like, well, I'm going to do this. I mean, it's not just, oh, I'm a buddy, little puppy. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, I'm literally going to go, nope. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I mean, again, I, I, I like I like the care I like the puppy I like the family thing and then I'll add this in too while I can I think the perfect opportunity to bring him back would be a wonderful little movie about Scooby's family and you could have uh, Mumsy and Daddy and and then some of his family stuff like literally have a show about the dogs and their family and a cool adventure bring them all together and bring it back you could bring them all back that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, by making it a separate movie, it wouldn't interfere with anyone's expectations. But uh, I don't know. Does that sound like a good idea to you all? Like do a hey, uh, I'll Trevor, I, I can I can understand and appreciate uh, everything that you just said about that, about your thoughts on you know why people dislike Scrappy. And I think that's a great idea of how they could uh, you know bring him back. Yeah, I would you love to see that. And, yeah. Movie. Yeah, soften his edges. So yeah. that's it. I mean, I th I feel like Scooby Doo. Also, there's so many different characters that they can bring back, and they choose not to. Like Scrappy Doo, yeah. Scooby Dum, Scooby D. I mean, even Vincent Van Gogh. Like, 
the possibilities are endless. There's so many characters, like side characters that people have loved. And it's like, you never see them. You, you never do, you know, so. Yeah, WB is missing the boat on those. That's for sure. You know, they maybe can totally maybe get away. Maybe they'll see this panel. Maybe they'll see this panel and, you know, never know. Yeah, what that's happen. what I was hoping. Maybe they'll see. Yeah. <laughs> they should be making a Hex Girls series or even doing yeah, something thank cool. You. Like, you know, the 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 actresses that, that voice them would be willing to actually go on tour yeah. as the Hex Girls. I mean, how cool would that be? If they awesome. just did 10 tour dates around the world, you know, people would go to that. That is a money maker right there. I would sure. see that. Yeah. Wendy, what are your thoughts on why? Uh, just tell us why you like Scrappy. It's fine. <laughs> we can handle it. <laughs> I can I can go with a little bit of the negative too, which I mean I have already touched on it, but see I feel that once they got rid of Lenny and Don Messick took over the role, it didn't just change his voice. Now I don't know if this was Don Messick's doing or if this was production being like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna change Scrappy's character a little bit, you know, because I I can see, you know, those first. 10 episodes or so and it's not just the voice he is very much a henry hawk as a dog that anyone who has ever seen that character on looney tunes and thinks about it like that it, it's the same character it really is and i'm really sad that that happened because i think that's the real underlying problem is that they tried to make scrappy something that already existed instead of letting him be his own character that was well suited for the series that he was in they were trying to capture something that had already been done and did it work in what it had previously been used for looney tunes it's pretty pretty popular you know i don't know how many people are like oh i love the henry hawk character like probably not very many but you know it it worked for what it was I don't think that Scrappy should have ever been that. And I feel like once Don Messick took over, regardless of whose idea it was, Scrappy stopped being a bully and he stopped being quite so headstrong. He still got the same tendencies, yes, but I think he's much more uh, responsible than he was in those early ones. Uh, one of my favorite Scooby episodes of all time is episode two from the 79 series, The Night Ghoul of Wonderworld. And yeah, I can think of a number of scenes that feature Scrappy. And I'm like, oh, might have been better if you had been later Scrappy acting in this. Now, when I was watching that when I was young, I can honestly say it never even crossed my mind. That, that I was like, oh, that's what he's doing is annoying. Or, and I never, I never wanted to like emulate any of his negative traits. Like it just never was a, it just wasn't a thing that I thought about or that I wanted to do because I really only focused on his relationship with Scooby and how he felt about Scooby because he was so vocal about it that all of the other stuff, it kind of just, I mean, obviously I was watching it and I was consuming it, but it's not what stuck out in my head like at all for whatever reason so i actually also think like i can remember because the intro for scooby doo and scrappy show when they were still like you know 23 minute episodes or whatever it is like a half hour show where they did have the gang so you know the Scarab one was episode one, the Night Ghoul in episode two. That is a full length, half hour Scooby Doo show that features the entire gang plus Scrappy. Then, when they transitioned to having some episodes where it was just Scooby, Shaggy, and Scrappy in the little like seven minute shorts, the intro is different. And I can remember Sunday mornings on the USA Network, USA Cartoon Express, and for a while they played all of these great Scooby shows. And I can remember loving 
you know, this, the sound of the train comes in and I'm like, oh, yes, like this is what I want to watch. And then waiting with anticipation to see if the final scene is Shaggy, Scooby and Scrappy running through a dark hallway or if it was them. So I think it's Scrappy carrying Scooby and Shaggy in through like a set of hospital doors and the gang is on the other side. And I will freely admit, anytime I saw the gang, I was like, yes, because I loved Scrappy, but I did love the gang and I did want to just see them all together. You know, it's okay, add in Scrappy. And I feel like it, he never took away when they were all in it together. I didn't really feel like he took away from any of the other characters. I thought that he fit in pretty well. I didn't, I didn't have a problem with it. However, I will say though, that those little shorts, I was reading some things and I watched some things and people are so critical about oh they're just garbage writing and it's really stupid and stuff and I'm like excuse me but what show are you watching like what's the matter with you because I personally think that those seven minute shorts are brilliant they are so imaginative is it classic Scooby no it's not but it wasn't meant to be it was meant to be, you know, it's Scooby for a new generation or Scooby a little different. You know, we're evolving. Would it be nice for things to sometimes stay the same? Of course, but that's just not how life works. You know, if all we ever had was the 1969 one season of Scooby, I'd be fine with that. You know, I could watch that until the day I die and never get tired of it and never be like, you know what, I'm bored. You should really update this. Like, I will never feel that way. You know, I really won't. So I don't personally think that things always need to be changing, but that is the world and most people, that is what they want. So they were, they were trying to adapt and they were trying different things. And to me, it really worked well because it was, it was different. It still had the same flavor, but like some people were criticizing, like they're the dumbest monsters. And I'm like, what, what's dumb about any of it? I don't, I don't know. I just, it, I don't look at those that way because when I was little I remember those little shorts being something that really sparked my imagination more so than maybe any of the other series because the the creatures were real you know um I love the one where you know Scooby Scrappy and Shaggy the 3S gardening service and they end up in this crazy garden of this guy who looks like a giant tomato and he wants his plants to eat them, you know, and they have to get out of there. I don't know. As a kid, as a kid who was like maybe seven years old, that just like set my mind ablaze. And it was so colorful. I've talked about this before, how even though obviously I love classic original first two seasons of Scooby-Doo, I also really love like the late 70s into the 80s because the colors were brighter. You know, it was it was just more vibrant and stuff. And I 100 percent think that that is just one of many things that made me want to be an artist when I grew up. Because these wonderful shows with such creativity in them, you know, I'm sorry, it takes talent and it takes skill and it takes a little bit of thinking to draw a guy. But he's a tomato. Okay, it just does. Okay, I know that people don't, if, if you don't like it, that's fine. But don't, don't sell it short for what it is. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it's not valid as something that is good. You don't have to like it, you know, but I really felt that all of those shorts, I love Tender Bigfoot where they're camping and they're trying to get their, their badges and they run into Bigfoot. I, I don't know. I just loved it. It's only like seven and a half minutes long, but that's all that you needed. And the way that it was drawn, the scenery, and just, I just, like, that's what I would show to, to my kid. If I had kids and I wanted them to cultivate some kind of like a creative imagination, that's the kind of stuff that I would show them. I would be like, come and watch this and just like take in the art of it. Maybe that was it, is that for me, it was more about art and less about being entertained by a story. You know, I do find that even now when I watch stuff, 
it's not that I have a hard time paying attention. I'm just paying attention to all the things that are not the story. I'm looking at the wardrobes. I'm looking at the set design. I'm looking at the backgrounds and I can't help myself. That's just, that's just me. That is just my brain. So maybe the stories just didn't matter as much to me. And what I was really focusing on was what I was seeing, you know, what I could visually take in. And I just loved it. I don't, I just don't see anything, anything wrong with it. Do I wish that Scrappy had been the Don Messick Scrappy all along? Yeah, of course I do, you know, but the fact is I love all of those Lenny Weinrib episodes. They're just, I just love them. I don't have any problem with, well, that's actually, <laughs> let's maybe address that elephant in the room that Scrappy is not the problem, but Martha Frumpkin voicing Velma is. Okay, why is nobody ever talking about how horrible that era for Velma was? Because I, I don't know why this one always sticks out in my mind, but it's Happy Birthday Scooby-Doo, and it's broken into two episodes, and it's the Red Skull. They're doing like a version of This Is Your Life, Scooby-Doo, and the Red Skull is trying to like bust everything up. And I just, oh my gosh, guys, all I can hear is Velma's voice in that episode and it's it's not even just the sound of the voice it's that she literally sounds like you know how when they make like an automated phone system today and it's like they just record somebody saying either words or letters or sounds and then they just digitally put it together based on whatever you are putting into the system i'm sorry but that's what she sounds like like just bad acting it's it's not just that I don't care for like the pitch of her voice it's that oh Scooby what are you doing (laughs) Scrappy's not the problem okay (laughs) maybe there was a problem with those episodes but I don't think it was Scrappy and stop blaming Scrappy when there are bigger problems bigger fish to fry you know what I mean like I don't know I I did make this little setup of all of the scrappy pieces that I have, which I wish that there was a lot more. And I do, I'm actually, I've been so distracted because Cam has, <laughs> is that another Mighty Star scrappy behind you, but it's just bigger than mine? Yeah, let me show you. The, <laughs> other, the other one, the other here, one, the bigger one. one. And then here is so this cute. one right here. That big yeah, one. see that That's one, awesome. it, he's a Mighty Star, isn't he? Yeah, he's Mighty Star. Yeah. yeah. So he's like one size, one or two sizes up from mine. Yeah. And my best friend's mom got me this little guy. She's passed away now, but many, many years ago. And I didn't even know that she knew that I loved Scooby. And one day for Valentine's Day, she hands me this bag and it was this scrappy and like a little Scooby with a heart. And I was like, how did you know? She's like, oh, I saw it at a yard sale and I thought you would really like it. And he was missing his tag. So I made him one. But so this Scrappy is very sentimental to me. I love him very much. But uh, I don't know. I, I People can say whatever they want and people can think what they want. But as for me and my house, we will love Scrappy. <laughs> Is that sounding like the Book of Cameron? That's also a quote from Cameron, the Book of Cameron. I'll be sending the Ten Commandments out to you all soon, so be looking in the mailbox. Oh, my God. Cameron, um, why don't you tell us why you like Scrappy? Or if you can relate to anything that, that we said about there being issues with Scrappy. You know, I, I hopped, yes, for sure, Nikki. I hopped on this panel and I, I you've been telling why I like Scrappy. I, there is a, actually a couple things that I, I kind of dislike and I would change. Um, and so I'll start with the, my, dis, my dislikes and how they've kind of turned into to likes in a way. Um, you know, when I first hopped on, I said, you know, there's nothing I would redraw or change. Um, I kind of, I kind of have, I kind of have to apologize for that because there is one thing I would have, there was an episode and I should know which one it is, but I, I, I'm trying to think of which one it is, but there was a leash and scrappy dude was walking on all four and he looked so cute as a puppy walking on all four. And I, I, there was some moments when he would run, he would run on all four. I thought he was cute that way, drawn that way. Now him running on two feet 
I mean, that's, that's just now scrappy. That's, that's his traits. But when I, but that's when, when I would watch him, I kind of disliked that a little bit because when I would see him walk on all four versus him, you know, with both, you know, standing on two feet, you know, and actually having like real hands in a way, you know, it, that's kind of one thing I didn't like. Um, another thing that um, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't a big fan of, was how they just made 16 episodes where it was the gang and it was scrappy for the scooby-doo and scrappy doo show and then all of a sudden they you know they got rid of fred and velma they started doing more with daphne shaggy uh, scooby shaggy and excuse me scooby, ugh, sorry daphne scooby shaggy and scrappy and you know like wendy said are those great episodes sure they are but there's 99 of them and yes, they are seven minutes, but it's a lot of them. And I kind of felt like in a way, some of them were, were uh, re, you know, there's a lot of repetition in those episodes. And I didn't like that. Um, I kind of felt like they, they, re, they repeated Scrappy and Scooby and Shaggy in some ways that were just kind of like, okay, we've seen this before. You know, so I kind of felt like that's where I kind of got a little bit of, of, um, a little bit of annoyance from Scrappy in a way, but I also felt a little bit of annoyance towards Scooby and, and, and Shaggy in those certain episodes. Now, was there episodes that I, that I liked from those seven minute ones? You, you bet. I, my favorite ones when they all turn into werewolves. I thought that was so funny. I mean, I, I loved it. Um, you know, uh, like what Trevor said, I, I my favorite Looney Tune character is Foghorn Leghorn. I grew up with Foghorn Leghorn. Um, and so I feel like, you have cartoon characters that are meant to be headstrong, to take no for an answer, and to always rush into danger. And I'll give you some examples. Number one, Scrappy Doo. Number two, Henry Hawk. And then also, too, like number three, Wile E. Coyote. They always have an objective and they always have a mission. And nothing in the world is going to get them off that mission. Scrappy's always going to try to go for the bad guys. He's always, he always wants to rock them and sock them. And then Henry Hawk is, you know, he's always wants chicken. So he's always going after Foghorn Leghorn. And Wile E. Coyote always wants um, the Roadrunner and kind of like Sylvester and Tweety, you know? But you have these characters that are headstrong in a way. And here's my thing, guys. They work. They really do. And, but I, I, that's where I feel like some people start to dislike those characters in a way because they do the same thing over and over and over again. I disliked how they kind of portrayed Scrappy in a way as that was it. We just saw Scrappy as this puppy. That was that, you know, I kind of would have liked to see a little bit more backstory of Scrappy. I like I would have liked to seen a little bit more of Scrappy take on, you know, you know, certain things here and there. Now I did, I will say I got to see that a little bit in the 13th Ghost. There was only 13 episodes, or 12 or 13, excuse me. And we that's always that's always saw Scrappy. And in the three movies, and we actually saw, like I said, guys, I actually saw Scrappy start to mature, but then they capped him at, you know, 13th Ghost after that, and then, you know, the, the three movies, and then that was it. Then we see him in the 2002 movie, and I know we'll talk about that later, but, you know, what a horrible comeback they made for him in that. And then, all, and then also, too, I don't like how they portrayed him in Mr. Incorporated. Was he actually on the show? No, we saw a statue of him. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, I don't like how, um, I don't like how, you know, it was just a statue of Scrappy. And then all of a sudden, you know, Daphne, Daphne goes Fred and Fred holds her and says, we promised we would never talk about what happened. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, are they talking about death of Scrappy-Doo? Because if so, like, what the heck? We're talking about a kid's cartoon. And like I said, go back from previous panels. I don't like when you start throw death. And I don't like when you start throw certain elements like that in Scooby-Doo. Keep it pure, keep it clean, keep it fun. That's why I prefer always the original stuff, kind of to the new stuff. Because I feel like they're always trying to take elements from the day's age and throw it into Scooby-Doo movies. Is that good? Yeah, it can be good. Can it also be put in a very bad way? Yeah, it can be put in a bad way. You know, um, I will say, and, I, and nobody has, has brought it up yet. But I, I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and there's a Six Flags not too far from me. I went to Six Flags a lot as a kid, and that's where I got a lot of my Scooby-Doo merch from for my collection. But I also got a lot of Scrappy-Doo merch from that shop. 
And another thing too is, is the gang would always walk around Six Flags Park. But the cool thing was, is there was a scrappy mascot that walked around Six Flags Park and kids would scream his name and run up to him and hug him and want to get pictures with him. People love scrappy. And think about it too. I mean, here, I got a, got a cup up here. King's Island right here. I, there was so much scrappy merch at King's Island and, um, oh, Wendy, what was it? Can Canada's Wonderland, am I correct? Canada's Wonderland, Is that yeah. Correct? Yeah, Canada's Wonderland. Yeah. There was so much scrappy do merch and there was so much mention of scrappy and the pictures and all this. He was popular in those theme parks. You know what I mean? And yes, I know theme parks are, aren't always the, the main, you know, media and stuff like that, but people love scrappy in that sense. I mean, I will say, I went, I went to Six Flags not too long ago, or excuse me, my friend did. Um, and my friend said, I asked my friend, I said, did you see a lot of Scrappy? They, they said, when they went to the Warner Brothers store, there was a section for Scrappy and Scrappy, the, 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 um, the, uh, the mascot of Scrappy kept walking around the park. And I thought to myself, that's awesome. That character lives on. And so I, that's like I said, that's Six Flags making that decision. Now, like what me and Justin kind of said in a, in a part of this panel, you know, Warner Brothers, they don't want him back in a certain way. But I hope there's certain people up there that say, hey, I think there's been enough hate for him. I think we need to bring him back. I think we need to do it in a positive way. You know, um, I, I, you know, the jokes that be, that's made about Scrappy, I don't think they're funny, to be honest with y'all, because it, it's to a level of of hate and negativity and it's like what wendy and nikki and all of y'all said there's so much hate and negativity in this world when i turn on tv and when i watch scooby-doo it makes me happy and i don't want to see negativity thrown into the scooby-doo franchise well there has been negativity thrown into the scooby-doo franchise and it's been some of it's been about scrappy but some of it's been about other stuff too you know relationship conflicts or you know we need to throw this in there or we need to throw this in there and i'm thinking to myself leave it out guys leave it out you think about scrappy do is there certain things that make him annoying in some some situations yes there is is there certain things that make other characters annoying in scooby-doo franchise or other franchises you bet but do i think that they can take those negativity things or the things that from the past that have made him annoying and start turning them into positive things i bet I, i'm yes i'm sure you can and I think to myself, if somebody actually goes back and watches all these episodes of Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo and Scrappy-Doo Mysteries and the Scooby-Doo and Richie Rich show, I mean, you know, there were so many Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo things from here to there. I think that they can do their research and say, hey, look, we're going to bring Scrappy-Doo back. But let's look at the ways that people didn't like him in those certain situations and let's fix them and let's not repeat these mistakes. And I think he would make a great comeback. So, you know, like I said, whether you're watching Looney Tunes, whether you're watching Scooby-Doo, whether you're watching a Disney show, whatever you're watching, you're always going to have those characters. But here's my thing, guys. It's kind of like life. You look at human beings. Are we all perfect? No, we're not. Do we fall short? Yes, we do. Are we annoying in a sense? Sometimes we can be. You know what I mean? But does that mean we have to be scrapped as human beings? Or does that mean that the character has to be written off? No. Just fix on those mistakes and move on. You know what I mean? Um, I, you know, I, I will say, and I'm not trying to jump forward, Nikki, but, you know, from the 2002 movie, it wasn't one of my favorite Scooby-Doo movies. And it was actually, that was the very first one I went to go see in theater. And I was little. But when I saw Scrappy Doo on screen, I was so excited. I got so pumped up as a little kid. I mean, my mom was having to keep me quiet in the movie theater because everybody was like, what in the world? I was like, ah, Scrappy Doo! And I was just like freaking out. But then, you know, <laughs> they start to, to take him in this cocky, awful, just bad character. And I'm thinking, and then I, I, when I walked out of the movie theater, mom goes, what's wrong? I was like, and I mean, as for a little kid, I, I mean, I was uh, now I'm, I'm honestly now that I'm 23, I, I'm shocked at myself back then that I was I had enough mental capacity to think to myself, that's not Scrappy Doo. And I walk out of the movie theater and I thought to myself, I mean, I was a little kid and I thought to myself, they did Scrappy wrong, you know, but 
I guess the question is, is how are they going to bring Scrappy back and how are they going to do him right? I have a great idea for them to bring Scrappy back. Oh, yes. Let's he hear could it. start. They could start using him in anti-bullying campaign and they could bring him back that way. There you a go. A changed dog. That is how they could bring him back. That would be perfect. Great idea. I like that. I really do. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Warner Brothers. Let's go. We expect this to happen. Let's go. I'm sticking. Yep. <laughs> Hands have spoken. Justin, um, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, I, 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 don't remember what the, what, I don't remember what the question was. Uh, <laughs> it was what we like about Scrappy, right? Is that? Yeah, the, or the, or if there's things that you understand that why people dislike him. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I won't make it too long, but yeah, I, I like I said, I, and like with you and Trevor, so I understand why people wouldn't like Scrappy. I think I also, I agree with what Wendy and Cameron were saying. The the original voice was pretty bad, although I loved those episodes, the half hour episodes with, with the entire gang. Um, yeah, and I understand that, you know, if, as a kid, if you see the rest of the gang just get sidelined and then they're just completely gone for the show, I can understand why, you know, somebody wouldn't like that. Um, but so I, I guess I do understand why people don't like Scrappy Doo, but I also agree that it's you see too much hate for Scrappy, and he doesn't. Des- I don't think he deserves it. I mean, he saved the entire franchise. If Scrappy Doo did not exist, we would most likely probably not have all the Scooby Doo content that we are continuing to have to this day. So right. I just feel like there's such a disjustice to Scrappy, and that's why I get so upset when I see just him getting crapped on all the time because he did he saved the franchise you know um yeah does anybody else have anything to add to why we like or dislike scrappy did y'all see that cartoon network bumper they did of him did anybody else see that? I mean, it, it's all over you. Which YouTube. one? There were two or three, the, I recall. The one where he was, where they were, the other cartoons were walking into the studio yeah. and he was bullying yes, yes, them yes. all. Mm-hmm. See, he's a bully. That's why they need to do an anti-bullying but I do campaign not with like him. They, so that that's they can, not scrappy. They can fix it was that. not scrappy. No, it's not okay. like he's you know like, and you. Uh, I was here before you uh, and you oh, and you. you know what? <laughs> Let's bring that Bible in that's real quick. Well, I'm going to get this all under control, children. No, I, you know what? I, yeah, it was not scrappy. It was you just like this it. little... Was it a clone? Was it a clone yeah, cam? It was a clone. clone. That's, I'm sticking with it. That's my story. Yes. Okay. See, and to me, the way that they portrayed him was the way that I felt he was like in at least the first season. He was just mean and obnoxious, and he always went after people. He was calling everybody names, and he was obnoxious. So to me, well, to be fair him. though, to be fair though, he wasn't just indiscriminately going after people. He would often go after someone thinking it was the bad guy, but he's made a mistake. You know, yeah. there is a great scene where he jumps an old man in. The night ghoul and they had ridden you know the special train to wonder world with him i can't think of his name right now and it's going to kill me that i i any other time i would know his name because i love that episode so much and i can't think of it now that i'm talking about it but you know mr mr Waldhouse or something something like that doesn't matter and you know he scrappy thinks that it's the night ghoul because the night ghoul ran off and he jumps on him and the guy's like, blah, 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 what's the meaning of this? And Scrappy's <laughs> like, oops. You know, sorry. I, I'm, I'm just a doggy, and I'm allowed a few mistakes. You know, so it's not like he was targeting innocent people. He was just in his zealousness to solve the mystery, making mistakes and jumping on the wrong person, which is kind of what used to happen to, like, Scooby and Shaggy where they would get caught up in a trap that was meant for the ghost. You know, it's just that Scrappy was bringing in other characters from the episode and accidentally pouncing on them or punching them or kicking them or biting them, (laughs) whatever the case may be. So I feel like that's, I do feel like that's an important distinction. It's not like he was just a little jerk puppy running around, just biting people 
like a chihuahua, you know, that has no rhyme or reason for what it's doing. Scrappy made lots of mistakes because he did not practice look before you leap. And I kind of wonder, honestly, if we can take just a minute to ask this question. I wonder if that was not part of what the studio hoped to do with Scrappy and why perhaps in the beginning they did take such an aggressive, belligerent attitude with him as opposed to toning it down right from the start. And I wonder if they were trying to make a point to children that this is what happens when you're not careful, when you don't listen to your elders, when you don't pay attention. You don't just get yourself into trouble, but you get these people that you care about into trouble too. So I think that's another reason that I never disliked him, even during that phase where he was like a more annoying type of character, was that I learned from that, like, don't be like that. That it's good to have a lot of heart and a lot of spirit and to believe in what you're doing and what you want and to care about your friends and your family and to want to help people and to want to get things done. That is good. But if you have no self-control, you're just a liability and you're going to get yourself and other people into a lot of trouble if you're not careful. And so I wonder if that was why they they did take such a such like aggressive is the only word that I can think of to, to describe how he was in the beginning, because in some of the stuff I was reading, they admit that Don Messick had the best, um, re, uh, not rehearsal. No. When they're interviewing you, what is the word? Audition. Is this read? Audition. Audition. Yeah, that's it. That he had the best audition out of everybody and they still chose not to go with him. And I've always wondered like, why? Why did you I think he that? wanted too much money? I think I read in one thing he wanted too much money. I thought he had another project going on and he wasn't uh, able to do it. And then Lenny Weinrib wanted too much money to continue doing oh, okay. Scrappy. Right. Okay. And then Don Messick was able to do it at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I feel like all of those old cartoons, especially from Hanna Barbera, that they always had something extra in mind other than we're here to entertain the kids. It's like, yeah, we're here to entertain the kids, but what can we, what can we like just slip in to teach them? You know, like making your kid a smoothie and throwing a stick of broccoli in it, you know, and it's full of fruit and stuff. So it tastes good and they don't know the broccoli is there. Now they're going to eat it. And I just, I just feel like there, there was more to Scrappy than what any of us realize when they were thinking of adding that character in the way that they did did it was it the most successful execution of it no it wasn't but i can appreciate if there was thought behind it that maybe we can use this as a teaching aid for the kids to show that heart is good but heart without your head will get you into trouble every single time you got to have a balance of you know logic and emotion because if you're all emotion, you're going to run into a situation and you are going to be in trouble. And unfortunately, as people should realize in every aspect of life, typically choices that you make for yourself, they do affect other people, even if you think that they don't, which is why you should be extra careful and not be like, well, it's my choice. I'm just going to do it. Well, no, it's probably going to affect some other people too. And you don't want to be hurting other people. If you could just hurt yourself, well, fine whatever that's what you want but no if what you're going to do is going to affect other people negatively don't don't do that and I feel because I feel like they never allowed Scrappy to go undisciplined is a little bit harsher than what I'm thinking but Scooby tried to correct him you know when Scooby grabbed him from doing something stupid or from something that was dangerous like or shaggy and they would tell him Scrappy don't do that. It's dangerous. They were they were trying to correct it. So they weren't just portraying a character with some kind of bad behavior and just leaving it like that, which also makes me think that there was like a teachable moment that they were trying to just like surreptitiously weave into the story with this new character. I don't know. I think it's possible. I 
I like to think that it is because it does sort of just endear it to me even more. But I just feel like the studio was just known for having cartoons that were not just really fun to watch, but that if you paid attention that you could learn something and it was never preachy or in your face, like that you, as a kid, you didn't even know you were learning these things. I feel like Scooby-Doo was a great one for that kind of stuff. All of the classic series, all the way up, you know, I don't know about a pup named Scooby-Doo, but all of the other ones, I feel like there were definitely a lot of times where like, yeah, that's, that's a good thing to emulate, you know, what they're doing, how they're, how they're dealing with things and stuff like that. So I don't know. I feel like Scrappy really wasn't any different. Did the execution suffer a little bit? Maybe. But then again, here we are and we're having this discussion. So if you're still talking about it, it must have been some success. You know, hasn't been forgotten. So Wendy, you bring up a good point that Scrappy was a bad influence. And... (laughs) (laughs) and it makes me wonder you know he was always so quick to be throwing fists around how many kids you know went to like daycare or or school and they were like punching other kids puppy power just knocking them out (laughs) exactly (laughs) but you know in a way, we have you. I mean, can we just appreciate the fact that Don Messick has done the voice of Scooby Doo and Scrappy, and Scott Ennis has done the voice of Scrappy and Scooby as well? So, it, I, to me, it's kind of cool how both voice actors have jumped between the uncle and the nephew. I mean, if y'all really just stop and think about that, no one's really talked about that. That's cool that two voice actors have been able to balance because their voices are not similar. Scooby and Scrappy's are not you know, but their uncle and nephew. Um, and Wendy, I'm not trying to to correct you or anything, but in A Pup Named Scooby-Doo, there was actually an episode where they were talking how drugs were bad. So oh, that's I, true. That's true. Yeah. And, but yeah. but uh, Wendy, what I'm trying to say is I love how you brought that up. The Scooby-Doo franchise has taught it. Guys, if, I don't care if you're watching the 1969 Where Are You version or if you're watching the, the, the recent version of Guess Who? There's always something good that they're trying to portray in these episodes or movies. And whether it's talking about how drugs are bad, how to not bully, how to, you know, try to get along with everybody or how to, you know, bite your tongue or how to always look on the positive sides of things. I felt like the Scooby-Doo franchise out of every cartoon that we have ever gotten has been the best. And, and, and yes, Am I biased on that because I love Scooby-Doo and he's my favorite cartoon in the whole world? Maybe. But I just feel like the franchise has done a good job about it. And like Wendy said, I've been, I've, and I'm still this way. I, when I, when somebody wants to put something in, in, in a show or situation, if you want to put it in there, fine, but put it in a way where it's not shoving it down our throats. I'm a person where I, I don't like something shoved down my throats. I don't want to watch a cartoon where it's like drugs are bad and you're going throughout the whole cartoons. And, you know, growing up as kids, when we were in school, you would always watch those little tutorial videos where it was like a cartoon or something. And it was like, drugs are bad. I mean, it's every single second. Drugs are bad. Drugs are bad. We get drugs are bad, you know? But then you take that Pup Named Scooby-Doo episode, and I remember it till this day. Ever since I saw it when I was a little kid, I, I, I was like, okay, drugs are bad. But they threw it in there. They, they caught the villain, or you know, they, they saw how the dolphins were smuggling drugs in and out of the thing. And Velma said, drugs are bad, kid. She never repeated it, and that was it. You know what I mean? Scooby-Doo has been good about that. He has not shoved things down our throats, yet they have just emulated how to be a good person positive person and i feel like and this may sound silly but scooby-doo has been a great role model not only for kids but for adults and has there been times in my life where i want to punch somebody or if i want to yell at somebody or get angry yeah but you have to go back and think to yourself how does that portray in a way of your character and then when I watched Scooby-Doo, his character was always good. And he was always looking on the bright side of things. And I feel like, yes, can Scrappy-Doo 
be a bully in a certain way, Nikki? Yeah, he can. Can he be annoying in a certain way? Yeah, he can. But I felt like his heart was in the right place. And I feel like that's what the Scooby-Doo franchise has, has done for us as fans for 52 years very strongly. Yeah. So we know that Scrappy was the villain in the live action movie. And he was a jerk in that movie. I mean, he, he was made to be a jerk. And I really think that it had something to do with all the Scrappy hate at the time. I want to, I, I feel that now, you know, being 20 years since the movie, people don't hate Scrappy as much as they did. But I feel like at that time, you know, that was around the time that the, the Cartoon Network promo was made. Um, I feel like people expected Scrappy hate and they played off of that so that they could, in their way, make fans happy. Um, so in the movie, he devised a plan to try to take over the world and at the expense of all of the humans. And somebody had asked James Gunn on Twitter why they made Scrappy the villain in the movie. And James Gunn's response was, because Scrappy is just a completely awful person. Oh my gosh. Well, James Gunn, Scrappy's not a person. He's a dog. Amen, Nikki. <laughs> my new ringtone. Can you repeat Ew. that one? More time? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I never actually oh. saw that before until today when I was doing some research and and it really kind of annoyed me one because yes Scrappy's a dog he's not a person like you can't make a statement like that he's not a person Scooby's not a person it, it's but I think if you're going to be making a movie and you're going to include a character you need to at least give that character some substance in the movie not just we hate you so we're gonna do everything we can to make everyone else hate you too you know that's it's not fair I mean did Scrappy deserve to be treated like that in the movie probably not because he did mature as Cameron said as time went on he did mature he wasn't as annoying he wasn't as much of a bully and by this point I would think that he wouldn't have been like that at all because he would have been a lot older at that point. So do you guys think that the movie, and, and Wendy had brought this up, do you think that the movie caused people to hate Scrappy more because of how they portrayed him? Justin, we'll start with you. Yeah, I do, because I feel like when you have a theatrical movie, that reaches a wider audience than maybe a lot of like the hardcore fans of something. Whereas I know like when Scoob just came to theaters last year or was supposed to come to theaters, there was a lot of people who didn't even realize that Scooby-Doo was actually still going on. A lot of people were thinking that that movie was like the first time Scooby-Doo has been making a comeback probably since the original. And that's not, you know, not true. So yeah, when, scooby-doo the movie came out in 2002 i feel like a lot of casual scooby-doo fans seeing that and maybe even people seeing scooby-doo for the first time like young children they were already getting that uh, they, they were already seeing that scrappy-doo is a villain and i think a lot of people um just you know just associated then from there on out that scrappy-doo was was a was a bad character was a you know he was a negative influence in in the scooby-doo franchise um so yeah i mean I, I really do think that that played a huge part in like the scrap the continued scrappy-doo hate um and it's it and it sucked because scooby-doo the movie like i actually really enjoy scooby-doo the movie minus <laughs> what they did with scrappy i hated the ending i hated that he was the villain but the movie itself was fun. Like the setting, like when they go to Spooky Island, like everything about that is, I loved it. I still love it. But you're right. Like, um, like kind of how Cameron was saying earlier when he went to the theaters to see it. Like, I remember watching that for the first time. And like, it, it was almost like I was scared because you know, I was so young, but I, I was like scared when I was watching it because I, I knew that I knew that that wasn't Scrappy-Doo. I, you know, I, I knew that Scrappy-Doo was a lovable 
little, you know, happy pup. He loved his uncle Scooby. So when you saw him like that, I mean, it got very dark. He was very evil. I mean, you're right. He was literally trying to kill Mystery Incorporated. I mean, you could even say he was trying to kill everybody, really. I mean, it, if you really stop and look at it, I mean, it got super, super dark. I think when he was even getting arrested, when they're shutting the the helicopter door on him, you can hear him. Uh, I think he starts to curse. Mm-hmm. And you can, if you really listen, you can hear him. Like, that's not scrappy, do Like, that's just their way. That was just James James Gunn's way of writing him out of the show, and we haven't seen him since. And he, I've seen a lot of Scooby Doo, like, like for instance, one I think of is, do you remember the the evening with the Scooby Gang on the DVD for Aloha Scooby Doo? It was on the special features. It was like them on a talk show, and I remember, um, I remember somebody. I think it was Fred. I think he was talking about the sixth member of Mystery Inc. And he was actually talking about the Mystery Machine. But at first, the rest of the gang thought they were talking about Scrappy, and they made Shaggy made the comment, you know, oh, we we're never supposed to speak of Scrappy, kind of how like what Daphne and Fred said in Mystery Incorporated. And it's like ever since that movie, it's like you're right. It's like they never want to speak about him, or they don't know who he is, or it's always there's always this, it's always a negative association with him. I think ever since that movie, and it sucks. I I, I didn't think it was right. I also didn't think it was right that just because James Gunn didn't like Scrappy-Doo, you know, because he's you know, a big Hollywood writer, that he got to choose the fate. Now, I'm sure Warner Brothers probably had a part in it, but it just sucks that he got to choose the fate of Scrappy-Doo. And now because of that, it's like you you haven't seen him again since then. And I know, like, when I would – every every time I watch um, The Reluctant Werewolf, it always – it always sucks that really last scene because you know that's the last time you're going to see Scrappy Doo until he's the villain in 2002. And yeah, I mean, I I thought it was <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Cameron, what are your thoughts on the movie? You know, and y'all have heard me talk in the beginning of the panel of what I thought, what Scott Ennis has thought. Um, when he was voicing him, he didn't agree with it. You know, here's my thing. Okay. I didn't like that Scrappy was the villain, but in an alternate universe, let's just say that, okay, they did keep Scrappy Doo as the villain. Okay. And I, I, I don't agree with it, but let's just say they did keep Scrappy Doo as the villain. They didn't even really give him much backstory and they didn't give him much scenes in the movie. Y'all stop and think about it. There was a part where he was in the mystery machine. He peed on Daphne and he said, if y'all can't stand it, I'm out of here. And I'm as cute as a Powerpuff girl. And they kicked him out of the mystery machine and they drove away. That was it. Because it was Velma's flashback. Then you see him come up out of that weird dude's head, that robot dude. And he, you know, then he starts to turn to that big, awful scrappy. And then shaggy removes the thing from him you know and and i guess that that scene really made me cringe because it was like if because i watched it today i watched scooby-doo the movie today and the way scrappy was talking about scooby it was like you know because you know scrappy picked him up when he was the big monster picked scooby up by the tail and goes you look so much bigger on tv it was like he wasn't even his uncle he was Mm -hmm. talking about scooby-doo like he was just some regular mutt or dog that just came out, you know, that he never met in his whole entire life. And that really, that really pissed me off. And I agree with Justin hundred percent. Why do we let one person like James Gunn, and I'll be honest with you, has James, James Gunn done some great things? Yeah. But I really hold some kind of little bit resentment towards him because of what he's done to Scrappy, a character that has been around for quite a while. And then you just trash him. And then like you said, Nikki, I honestly didn't know he said that on Twitter. And that's honestly, I mean, if you're applying to a Scooby-Doo fan, at least say, hey, we, were, we weren't big fans of him. We, you know, we, we thought he wasn't, a, you know, was going to be a great character. But just, just to curse at somebody and say he was, oh, he was an effing awful person. Like, really? You know what I mean? And that's my thing. You've got people looking up to you. How are you going to act? But some people don't care. Some people just don't really care about their appearance. And here's another thing, too. After Scrappy Doo, they pulled that thing out of his chest and, you know, they went back to being a puppy. Scooby slapped him against the wall. And to me, I felt like that was very, very uncalled for. And here's the reason I say that is because I don't like when they started, you know, 
when I don't know it, to me when somebody's watching that it's kind of like an uncle hitting their nephew and I know that's going to sound really silly or goofy but I'm serious you know you think about it kids and people pick up on things differently they really do so when you have Scooby and he slaps Scrappy and he hits the wall and he, and he hits down and Scooby kind of shrugs his shoulders I'm thinking to myself James Gunn did not do his research and some people at Warner Brothers that, that allowed it did not do their research on how Scooby and Scrappy had the best relationship. I love it. I love their relationship from the cartoons. And then, like, like Justin said, then the last scene we see, he, they, they put him in a character, uh, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, a pet carrier. And he's like, I would have gotten away with it uh, if it wasn't for you meddling kids. And even the SOB, and then before it could even finish the cuss word, they shut the helicopter door on him, and that's it. So here's my thing. Okay, you want to use Scrappy Doo as a villain? Don't put three scenes and then cause the hate for them. Why don't you give a backstory if you want to make them the villain? Because like I said, I don't agree that they're making them the villain. But if you did, you didn't give enough backstory to why he should have been the villain. You just said, oh, he peed on Daphne and he said that he should have been the leader. And then all of a sudden, it was just because, oh, he didn't get enough recognition. And that's, that's why he's trying to take over the world. I'm sorry. That's really a crappy plot, James Gunn. It really is. And now you put it into a movie in the, in the early 2000s that caused a lot of hate for Scrappy-Doo. Well, I feel like now as we go along more, more and more fans start to go back and watch the originals. More parents start to show their kids what they grew up with. And they start to show them classic Scooby-Doo, classic Scrappy-Doo. And, you know, I, you know, and my heart really does go out to, to Scott Ennis. It really does. Because I think to myself... It must be hard to voice a character that you love, and yet you have to you have to make him sound like the bad guy. You know what I mean? And it, that honestly, I, I mean, I if I if I was in the position where where Scott was and I was voicing Scrappy Doo, I, I would I would speak up. I mean, I know that would probably not be the best thing because Warner Brothers probably would just want you to voice it and don't say anything and be done, just go on. But I would voice my opinion and say, hey, look. This character has been around for this long. I understand that some people think he's annoying, but at the same time, are you just like throwing away all the great attributes that he has? You know what I mean? It's just to make him the villain in the movie? I mean, it, he was poorly, poorly, poorly portrayed in the 2002 movie. And was the 2002 movie one of my favorites? No. Did it have some great things about it? Yeah, like Justin said, I love Spooky Island. I love how they, they threw, you know, the original costumes in there at the very beginning. I love how they, you know, the Luna Ghost. I, I love certain things like that. But from that one scene with Scrappy-Doo, it broke my heart as a kid. It really did. Because I thought to myself, is this going to be the fate of Scrappy-Doo? And now I'm 23 years old and I still haven't seen him. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, so one person who directed a movie, like Justin said, can control his fate for the rest of the franchise. And yet I know Warner, some people at Warner Brothers have their hands dipped in it too. But that's pretty, pretty crappy. You know, I feel like James Gunn ripped that love and fandom away from some people. And, I, and if I were him, I would probably go on Twitter and apologize for doing that. But like I said, that's just me. It's possible that he has. I didn't look that far into it. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. was more interested in what he said about uh, why he made Scrappy the villain. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wanted to make the movie rated R. So <sighs> it probably would have been worse had oh, he gosh. been allowed to make the movie rated R. So. Well, and you know what? You say that, you know, to make the movie rated R, you know, when we have talked to Scott in the past, Scott said that there was elements that they wanted to throw in there about sex, about violence and stuff like that. And I'll be honest with you, the way that James Gunn was going, it, it could have been where Scrappy was killed. And I hate to say that, I really do y'all, but I'm just saying it could have been like that. Mm -hmm. James, it's like James Gunn had so much hate for Scrappy that you're right, Nikki, if it was rated R, I think it would have been 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad someone stepped in and said, no, we're not gonna make it rated R. Can, I mean, could y'all have really imagined a rated R Scooby-Doo movie? I think that would have wrecked the franchise. I, mean, I was it, surprised it, it, by the way that they were even dressed in the movie. I mean, half the time Mary Jane wasn't even wearing anything. So, oh, I know. you oh, know, I, know. It, yeah. I, I couldn't believe that they even got away with that. Yeah. 
It was awesome. It was awful. I just, I hated that the, the way that they, they went about it in that way. You know what I mean? And as far as, and I'm, I'm not trying to talk forever. I'm just saying, but as far as the, the 2002 movie goes, was there great elements that was thrown in? Yes. But also too, you know, there was some things that were taken out. And, and the reason, and I know we're talking about Scrappy, but we are talking about Scrappy. There were certain elements that I feel like we didn't get to see of Scrappy. We didn't get to see Scrappy solve a mystery with them. If we would have actually saw, saw Scrappy and solve the mystery of the Luna ghosts with them or solve the, you know what I mean? There, that could have actually been really good and they could have set it up in a good way. You know what I mean? Or if you were going to make Scrappy a villain, at least do it where he was being possessed by somebody. And then, and then Scooby would have came in and broke that connection where he was, you know, being manipulated and he was saying, you know, Scrappy snap out of it. And that was, that would, it could have been where Scooby was being a good uncle to Scrappy and that could have betrayed a good message. But to me, it was like, it was like sex and how they were dressed. It was like, that's how, that's what sold the movie. You know what I mean? Cause you look at it there was, there were some darker things here and there uh, from the 2002 movie. Um, and I, I, you know, when I, when I go back and watch a 2002 movie, it just, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of like, in a sense, you can't have a bad Scooby-Doo movie, like a rated R Scooby-Doo movie. It wouldn't work. It would kind of be like, and I, I don't watch the show, but I know it's all, I know it's, it's a, a dirtier show, but like South Park, could y'all imagine a clean South Park? I don't think it would work. So South Park is, you know, rated R or whatever. And that's that sense. And Scooby-Doo is clean. But then you try swapping the two where Scooby-Doo is rated R and South Park's clean. It doesn't work. And so I'm thinking to myself, I, you know, I wonder how this 2002 movie would have gone if, if James Gunn wasn't directing it. If we would have had another director in there, you know, how, how could have this movie? Because I think Scooby-Doo 2, Monster Unleashed, was, was way better than the first one. And I, and I just feel like, like I said in the very beginning of the panel, you know, they missed the boat with Scrappy Doo, and if they made a third one, they could have gone back and redeemed his character. Get yet adding another new director in, you know. So I don't know. I guess it's just how it goes. I guess. Wendy, what are your thoughts on uh, the movie making Scrappy more hated? I definitely think that that was a huge contributor to that. And I think this is actually a lot more complex than even I realized until I started really thinking about it. But I mean, I think we've already established the possibility tonight that, you know, the majority of people don't hate Scrappy. They might be indifferent, but they're not the ones that like James Gunn, for sure. I think he definitely fits in the hate category. And 2002, so I was 16 in 2002. I did not go to the theater to see this. I was very much against a live action. Like it wasn't, it just wasn't my kind of thing. I am a very like boring traditional person. I, like I say, Scooby could have stayed exactly the same as he was in 1969. And I would never complain about that. I do like things that stay the same. That, that is just me. Uh, but someone did buy me the DVD. So I have seen that movie all of one time back in 2002 or whenever, 2003, whenever the, the VHS came out. And I think the biggest problem with that film is that that is not a film for children. Rated R or not, that is not a film for kids. Uh, and as we've spoken about on previous panels, at least something similar, I really don't like to see children's properties taken down a dark and perverted adult road. I think that that is a huge cop out to creativity and imagination. If you have to take something that is clean and wholesome and classic and pervert it in order to get your movie to be like your dream, your whatever you're fantasizing about, uh, just don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you want to take stuff in that direction, that's fine. But you pervert your own intellectual property. Okay. I get so tired of seeing, I don't know, I did not watch it and I, I didn't watch the Hanna-Barbera series or like years ago either, but you remember seeing trailers last year or the year before where they did some kind of horror version of the banana splits? Ugh. 
Yeah, I didn't. I saw the trailer for that, and like I say, I've never seen much more than a few minutes of like the original. But honestly, just the fact that they would do that offended me. Okay, everybody gets offended by everything today. Well, that's something that offended me because I'm like, excuse me. Okay, I might be an adult now, but I'm not so selfish that I'm like, well, everything that kids have, I want it too. It's okay to leave some things for the children. Okay, I feel this way about collecting even. When I see things that are priced like hundreds, thousands of dollars, and I'm like, <laughs> when I was a kid, all I could afford was like $5 for that. And as a kid, that's what I want. It's a toy. Okay. Are we treating these things like collectibles? Yeah, we are. These were toys for children. And so when I see things that are priced like they're one of a kind and made out of 10 pounds of gold, I'm like, well, you're stealing. Like, forget that I want this stuff. Completely forget that, that we as adults collect these things. We were children once and we wanted these toys. We played with these toys. We have loved these toys for 30 years in some cases. And that's a good thing. Children need things to play with. Children need things to learn from. Children need things to enjoy and to escape to. And when I see adults that have some kind of twisted fantasy, because I'm sorry, that's I'm saying that that's what that is. I've seen other things that James Gunn has done, and I'm not saying that he is not a talented person, but some of it is really friggin' twisted. And I don't think that that has any business in anything related to something that children watch. I can't even imagine like four-year-old Cam going to the theater thinking, I'm going to watch Scooby-Doo. It's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And what I remember of that film, like I, it, it like breaks my heart to think how many children watched that movie expecting Scooby-Doo and what they got was some kind of, I, I'm not saying that it's a bad movie just as a movie. I'm not saying that. Is there stuff about it that's good? Absolutely. There's a lot of stuff that's good about a lot of, things that are very questionable, you know, that we probably should like, probably shouldn't be watching movies about people murdering each other and going on sprees and things like that. We probably shouldn't. It's not good for us. Is it entertaining? Can it be done in a way that you want to watch it? Yes. Heck yes. As like a four-year-old, I wanted to watch horror movies. So I get it, you know, but Scooby-Doo is a children's character and I don't ever want to see him turned adult like content wise. That is not, I don't think that's appropriate. I didn't like it when they did it to Nancy Drew. I didn't like it in the live action movies where, yeah, they didn't go all the way because he couldn't get the rated R. I mean, like you guys said, I can't even, I don't even want to imagine what they would have done in that film if it had been rated R. Like I, I am so grateful that that is like not a thing and I hope it never happens. But can we please stop stealing from the children? We have taken everything from them. There's, you can't even, guys, there are no commercials for toys anymore. Has anybody noticed that? I remember so many commercials for toys when I was little. I'm 30, I'm going to be 35 years old. This is a long time. It's been a long friggin' time since I was a kid watching cartoons on the weekend. And I can still sing you. I could sing you the song for the Fountain Mermaid Barbie. It's ridiculous. I never even got it. I don't have that Barbie. I never got her. And I could still, I could sing you the song for that. All of these wonderful, wonderful things that were for kids. And like now, anytime I watch something that has commercials in it, it's like, okay, insurance, um, drugs for sexually transmitted diseases. Like that was a new one for me within the last like couple of years. And I'm like, what? Pardon? When did this get to be commercials on TV like you're buying a box of cereal? Like, it's just normal that, oh, well, we've all got 10 sexually transmitted diseases, so <laughs> let's just normalize this. Like, that's, honestly, that's how I feel when I see those things. And so we've taken away everything for that. And I feel like kids' shows today, like, stuff that is, like, legitimately tailored for children, it's so dumb. 
that I wouldn't, if I had kids, I wouldn't let them watch it because I would be like, by the time you're done sitting through 30 minutes of that, you will be stupider than what you were when you sat down. I really feel that way, that they treat children like they're idiots. When the reality is, I think it's like between the ages of four and six, kids learn like the majority of what they're going to learn in life. Like that is their most formative years. They're like little sponges. They soak everything up. And what you're making for them is so dumbed down that like you might as well be raising some kind of dog and not a very intelligent one. Like that's how they're treating it. Whereas I look at series from decades ago and they treated kids like they were adults. They talk to them like they could understand, you know, basic concepts and some more advanced ones. It was all about teaching them things. And it's just gone. Like, I don't know what children today, what is there for them that's like any good. And so I really don't, I don't have good feelings for that film from 2002 for multiple reasons. And, you know, Scrappy was just like the, the, the icing on the cake of, wow, this really sucks that this is what this has become. You know, it's not Scooby. Is there stuff in it to be enjoyed? For sure. And that's great if people enjoyed it. You know, I'm again, just because I don't enjoy something doesn't mean that it's not enjoyable. Other people that enjoyed it, like your opinion is valid. You know, I I don't have the only opinion in the world. But I just hate to see how, yeah, like that one film did so much damage and I'll be perfectly honest I think the damage went far beyond the Scooby franchise because if you really think back to it that kind of is the what kicked off the idea at least I if I'm wrong and somebody knows please do correct me but I feel like that film was what started the idea of ooh this is for kids how can we make it more adult How can we push the boundaries and make it for adults where the kids will want to watch it because it's that character. And so we can't go quite R, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know what it was rated, but obviously if they let Cameron in the theater and I think you would have been around four or five years old at that time. So it had to have a rating that they would allow you to go in. Um, But it's definitely like there's innuendo, there are references that are clearly intended for adults. And while there's a part of me that, you know, I can appreciate a dirty joke. I'm not a prude. I do enjoy that, you know, but there's a time and a place for it. And to me, that wasn't it. It just wasn't it. You know, I I have seen kids sometimes and like you're watching something and there is like some bit of innuendo and like they pick up on it. Okay. You think that they're dumb and that they won't, but no, they don't understand it. But you watch them and they catch it, that there is something, there's something there that they, they know that they don't understand, but they recognize that there's something there. And I just wish that he wouldn't have kicked open that door to allow all of the stuff that has come down the pike since then that has kind of ruined things for kids and for adults, because I am an adult who I would still rather watch a Scooby-Doo cartoon than like 95% of like drama or whatever is made for adults, you know, not even like an R rated thing, like just general network TV. There's like 5% of it that I enjoy and the rest of it, I, I could honestly like never see it again. And I could watch Scooby-Doo and enjoy that and never feel like I've, compromised my beliefs or my morality you know I don't feel dirty like there are certain things on tv that they're entertaining but like I feel kind of dirty that I just watched that happen yeah you know I'm like okay I get that you're acting so it's it's not real but I feel like that is something that nobody needed to see except for the people involved I didn't need to see it I didn't want to see it I did not enjoy seeing it and I feel I feel dirty that I've I've witnessed it, you know, and I think that's a shame that that could ever creep into something like Scooby or anything for children. You know, I think that there should be limits to stuff. I really I know that people don't like that idea. Freedom to do whatever you want, say what you want, whatever. Um, okay, 
I don't agree with that personally. I do think that there are boundaries and, and lines that you shouldn't cross. But the thing is, once you go over it once, everybody's going to go over it. You can't, you can't stop it. And I kind of feel like that 2002 live action Scooby movie was like the gateway drug into normalizing like basically debauchery in children's programming. Mm-hmm. That's how I see it. It's just debauchery. And again, can can we enjoy it? Sure we can. Do I want to enjoy it? No, I don't. I kind of feel sometimes like I should rewatch that movie because I would probably enjoy it now more as an as like an adult rather than because like when you're 16, you're not an adult. You're still a child. I don't care what anybody says. You're still a child. Um, but I kind of just don't want to. It's that simple. I'd rather put on like the crappiest episode of Scooby and Scrappy and watch Scrappy bully somebody. You know what I mean? <laughs> rather than James Gunn bullying Scrappy. I'd rather watch Scrappy bully somebody else. Okay, that's that's the fact of the matter. <laughs> anyway, please continue. <laughs> Trevor, uh, how do you feel about the live action movie and causing more people to hate Scrappy? Um, well, I think I agree with pretty much everything. And then thinking about James Gunn and giving how, given how like Rocket Raccoon was the character that uh, got love later, I'm like, well, wow, you missed an opportunity to do that with somebody like Scrappy um because that's a small furry loud character but they made that lovable and loyal and all so i mean him so i i don't i don't know what um i mean i saw when i saw the movie i was i was in my 20s and i was at a point where coming off of seeing you know which is ghosts alien invader like zombie island i was kind of prepared for them to grow up myself so certain aspects of that didn't bother me what really bothered me was how they had them treat each other which is really more insidious uh the the fred and velma thing just broke my heart i mean the way they spoke each other and all that and like and that obviously has been done in other things too and i'm just like yeah, he, he enjoyed, it was like picking apart. And like when you say, it's like it was something good. And instead of celebrating the good thing and maybe having some tongue and cheek humor, you, you really wanted to play a deconstruct game with Scooby and that didn't play too well with me. Um, yeah, and as I said, I'm, you know, my stand, I mean, I'm not that fond of Scrappy, but I, just because he got put out of the van, I really don't think he would have tried to destroy everything. I think what he would have tried to have done was maybe create a mystery himself that he'd solve in a big way and make it look like he was more important. Uh, you know, something like that. That would be fun. And that could have even been on the amusement park island. Uh, yeah, missed an opportunity, but he, he chose to spew venom and that kind of... Uh, kind of tainted the whole thing in the end definitely i think the i think scooby-doo 2 was made just as an apology to us because since there wasn't a three you know it's kind of like they were like oh let's let's not do this it didn't work and instead of saying you know it's a horrible franchise it's like well they they were like well i think maybe we handled it wrong or we handled it wrong but um, yeah i'm Again, as I said, my issues with Scrappy are with the situations and the surroundings and some of his story, which had nothing to do with him in the end. So this is a, another case. Yeah, I think he did it on purpose. I mean, I think, did we talk about the Blair Scooby project yet? Yeah. I mean, that, that brought in, was that right before? Was that after? That was 99, uh, I think. Thing. So that was after the bumpers where he was outside the studio and couldn't get in. I thought the bumpers were around 2000. I think they were all around the same time. But, yeah. um, you know, like where it was like, oh, it's Scrappy and Velma with the flashlight. And like, there were some things about that, again, I enjoyed. It was just fun. But, um, 
I don't know. It's like it's like I think some people in the studio just enjoyed and like in real life, sometimes like one of the kids in school starts having an obvious flaw or something and everyone just joins in. They're not even thinking about it anymore. I think they started up a thing about creating a scapegoat character of, of him and uh, I think it just got out of control. Yeah, I think James Gunn really hated Scrappy and that's why he did what he did with him. I mean, the tweet that he made was, it's pretty obvious that he right, had something yeah. against him for sure. So, so you brought up the Cartoon Network bumpers and the Scooby-Doo project. So some people say that all of these things were a conspiracy to make people hate Scrappy. And included with that would be the Scrappy was found dead in Miami tweets in 2017, which were based on a 2011 fan fiction called Darkly Dreaming Scooby by Wake Girl 14. And along with that, there was a, um, a website that posted the 20 most hated, car most hated characters in, in TV. And Scrappy was number one on that list. So, do you think that there really was a conspiracy to make people hate Scrappy around that time? Do you think that there's some reason that Warner Brothers just wanted us all to hate him in hopes that they would never have to bring him back? Cameron? Um, yeah, you know what? I, I think there is. Um, you know, here's my thing. People that work within Warner Brothers are people, you know? And when the, somebody works at Warner Brothers or a studio like that, whether it's Disney, Warner Brothers, whatever, you, they have to not sign their life away, but they've got to sign to keep things in private. But not everybody does that. Not everybody's, you know, honest and wholesome and good about that. Every, people leak stuff. And I feel like maybe somebody at Warner Brothers or somebody just wanted to do that to spark more scrappy hate because here's my thing scooby-doo 2002 did it go over well in a way yeah but it also didn't go over the best so maybe you know some people were saying hey scrappy was was done wrongly because i've seen a lot of people say that scrappy was done wrongly in the the movie franchise so maybe it was where someone along the lines you know started that conspiracy theory to really you know say okay you know what james gunn did good he, you know, he made Scrappy the bad guy. I'm going to create this, this conspiracy theory. And how, I'm sorry, I, but how stupid is that? Oh, uh, Scrappy is found dead in Miami. If you have that much time on your hands in your life to make a fan theory where Scrappy is dead in Miami, uh, I hope you're watching this. Get a life, like right now. Because, oh my gosh, let me tell you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, oh, it gets me so, <laughs> like, riled up. I just, I can't stand people having that much time on their hands where they're just like do they make these stupid things there it's a cartoon character you know what i mean you want to get fired up about something go on about politics or whatever but to make so, it more, oh i'm sorry those tweets are cataloged in the library of commerce the, and that's how they found them when someone was going through them and they found all these tweets about scrappy being dead in miami Oh my lord. So it's not one person, it's many people. Get a life. It's many, many people. It was started in uh, the fan fiction, but that was from 2011. It wasn't until 2017 that they found all of these tweets from just random people. You know, and honestly, too, I mean, I've also seen, and I don't know if y'all seen it as well, but like you go shopping on eBay or Etsy. You type in Scrappy Doo, and people make the most awful fan art of him. I mean, there was mm -hmm. one where it was it was uh, there was a guy standing there, and he had he had like a dinner plate, and he popped the dinner plate off, and it's all a gang looking at dinner plate, and it was a it was Scrappy's body, and he was dead on the plate. And I'm thinking to myself, like, really? I mean, it's a cartoon character. And here's my thing: I mean, kids, like Wendy said, kids are looking through this, you know. And I think honestly, you four can agree with me that. Scooby-Doo was meant for children you know what I mean and we want to keep it clean for kids but then you know people go on these rants and raids and I'm thinking to myself 
yes, we're five adults talking about Scooby-Doo, but we're talking about them in a way that, you know, is out of love and, you know, respect and, and kindness. But if you're just going to go on and rant on and start these things where Scrappy's dead in Miami, and, and I honestly think it's just one person who started it, someone thought it was funny, and they kept on with it, and it kept going, 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 going. And you guys know on Twitter, that's easy to do. Or, you know, there's a little fan fiction series that people like to start. I mean, there's – here's my thing, guys. When you have something that is, um, that is official merchandise, they're not going to go that far. Official merchandise is not like that. But then you get this fan stuff on there, and people go nuts. And I and you know what? This is going to sound really nasty, but for – but – one fan sent me a, a message when I very first started my Scooby Doo and Cameron Two thing that, and we're all adults here, but someone someone created a Scooby Doo porn movie, and yeah, and I'm like, what? And so, kid you not, there's a trailer and an actual DVD out there of a, a, a Scooby Doo porn movie, and I'm thinking to myself, it's a cartoon, and yet we're making all these things where I mean, and. and that's where it kind of scares me with with fans making merchandise and making rumors and making this stuff. I, I, I mean, some of the fans they get out of control, and it, and I mean, kid you not, I mean, me and Nikki know this, but the rest of y'all go look on Facebook or wherever, go look at some of the hashtag Scooby Doo fandom and the groups, and some people get real, real twisted and real weird. Oh, I mean, yeah. that one that there was that one that was going around saying that Scooby was euthanized and Shaggy and Shaggy and all the gang were crying. I'm thinking to myself, what? idiot started that you know what i mean so i'm sorry i went on a long rant nikki but but to answer your question you know i think it was somebody uh who 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 wanted who agree with james gunn and wanted just to score, destroy scrappy's reputation because it takes you can you can have one rotten egg and it just makes every everything else go bad so that's where i think trevor do you think that it was all a conspiracy to hate scrappy I mean, I don't, I think, I think it was a snowball. I think some people decided to do it. It was fun and they just joined in. There's several things I've read, like um, it's become internet irony to hate him. And then there's an internet irony now where people are trying to defend him again. I like the, the way things are going. It's like almost instead of people thinking about Scrappy for themselves, they're following all this just with a weird fandom idea. So even, even it's so meta it, even, even the hate, even the discussions like we're having for real people have been batting them back and forth on the internet, you know, so um, who, some people probably don't even know what they believe, you know, they were for scrappy one year and then they were against him the next, but uh I think sometimes it's it's easy it's fun to pick on the oddball person or it's it's kind of fun to to pick on something when it, you know other people you think are cool or are kind of picking on it too so I think I think it just uh started a bad snowball effect so people who were jerks and people like you and me who I think did and some of my friends who had legitimate issues not that they hated Scrappy, but that his presence undermined three people. I mean, I know they're not real human beings, but, you know, Fred and Daphne and Velma are kind of my friends. I mean, I, I kind of like Fred the best because, you know, when I was little, I wanted kind of to be Fred. But um, not many people do. And that's another thing we have a, a panel on. There's a lot of underlying Fred hate. And even, you know, it's sidelined and stuff and just the idea of of now him being yeah, being the young guy it's like him being the leader is the joke because in this culture you know since everything's equitable him assuming anything makes him foolish but i think i feel like there's fred hate that's kind of rising along that line of the scrappy it's like just it's easier to joke about something than to think about it so yeah. Justin, do you think it's a conspiracy to hate Scrappy? Um, yeah, in a way. I mean, yeah, I feel like they needed a, a way to, to like, even though he wasn't on the show from what was 88 when the Reluctant Werewolf 
came out until 2002. I feel like they needed a way to just like give closure for like how he, you know, like a reason why he wasn't on Scooby-Doo anymore because so many people hated him or the people making Scooby-Doo hated him. But I also feel like I'll make, I'll make an analogy here. So I really, besides Scooby-Doo, I'm really into music. Um, I really enjoy making music and I enjoy listening to music and I like uh, rock music. I like classic rock, modern rock, even like some heavy metal. And I know in, in that, in that music world, it's like, and maybe you guys know this, I don't know, but it's kind of like the cool thing to hate on Nickelback, the rock band Nickelback. And I'm not saying that I'm a Nickelback fan or not, but it's like they don't have horrible music. There's definitely some songs that I've listened to, uh, to a Nickelback that I, they're cheesy, they're really bad. But there's also some that I think are phenomenal. But that's become like they become like the butt of the joke in that industry and in that music world industry is it's the cool thing to hate on Nickelback. No matter what they put out, whether it's good or bad, people are just going to shit all over it, make fun of them for it. And I feel like that's the same thing with uh, with Scrappy and the Scooby Doo, uh, you know, the Scooby Doo world. It's like that's the cool thing for a group of people to do is to just just to hate on Scrappy. Honestly, God, I feel like some people don't even who don't even really know Scrappy Doo. They're just kind of jumping along on the train, just you know, just going along for the ride and, and hating on him for no reason. Um, so yeah, I I think I think just they needed to get him off the show and they wanted to give some kind of closure to why he wasn't popping up in any episodes or movies anymore and yeah i really do just think that like at least at that time that was like the cool thing to do people thought it was cool just to, to hate scrappy especially after that that movie came out it was in two so. yeah wendy do you think it's a conspiracy to hate scrappy i think it's less of a conspiracy and more of what trevor said that it's just a snowball effect. It really does only take one person to put an idea out there for a whole bunch of people to jump on that bandwagon and get it going. I don't think that it is uh, a coincidence, the timing of that, when you consider that the late 90s, early 2000s, in my opinion anyway, that is prime internet age. People are finally, you no know, late 90s, people are starting to get on the internet. By the early 2000s, more people have at home or at least at school internet access. And like I said earlier in the panel, I feel like people want to be negative about stuff. And that oftentimes the people that have that negative mindset are the ones that scream the loudest. And I have no doubt that. At that time, the people, the minority who hated Scrappy had this brand new outlet to share their hatred and their negativity with other people that previously they would have had no way to contact. And I think it just opened up a whole new avenue for them to share that negativity, spew that negativity, and for it to do like what Trevor said it just starts to snowball. And once that snowball is going downhill, you're not gonna stop it. It's gonna go until it hits the bottom and all you can do is get the hell out of the way. Don't get in the way of it. And so I, like, I, don't, I don't really think it was a conspiracy, but I think it just grew and grew and grew because people were being more vocal about it. The ones that didn't like it, found their platform. Uh, I can remember when we first got online here in like 2009 and forums, it wasn't really forums. It was more like, I remember Blaster, which I think was put out by Sci-Fi Channel and very big for like discussion on articles and stuff. I used to do it too. And people were very, very vocal. And it really did seem like people went around trolling for stuff that they didn't like so that they could leave negative commentary about it and start fights with people and, you know, get really nasty. And I suspect that that likely happened with Scrappy, where that little minority was like, wow, we have a huge voice now. And we can seem like the majority. And it just has continued on from there. It hasn't really stopped. 
uh, the 2002 movie, I think maybe combined with his own intense hatred of the character, I think James Gunn also witnessed the minority online screaming loud enough that they sounded like the majority and was like, well, hey, I'm not the only one and it's my movie and Warner Brothers isn't saying no. So I know I've got some people to back me up. Even if they are the minority, they're still going to scream the loudest and make the biggest fit no matter what. And like they say, uh, the only bad press is no press. So even if you make it into the into the press because something you did wasn't good, hey, you're still getting the publicity from it. So I think he kind of looked at it as a like, I can't lose. I can't lose. People might like it. They might hate it. It's probably going to be both. I'm still going to make a crap ton of money. And I get to voice my opinion about this character that I really don't like. And I think that it's just unfortunate that the internet for all of the good things, I mean, like, I consider what we're doing to be, like, a positive of the internet. We all live in a different place. I mean, I live in a different country than all of you. You know, we don't even live in the same country, for goodness sakes. And here we are, and we're talking to each other about a cartoon that's 52 years old. That's a positive thing. I think that's a very positive thing. But unfortunately, there is a lot of negative stuff that comes along with increased access to having a voice with nothing to censor you and i feel like as soon as you give people anonymity they're going to get negative and they're going to get nasty as soon as you give them a platform where they can say whatever they want and really there's nothing that can be done about it i feel like that is where trolls thrive and instead of putting their time and their energy and their effort into spreading positive things. They're perverted themselves. So what can we, you can't expect that they want to do anything other than spread more perversion to other people. And I feel like there's the only thing that miserable people hate is happy people. And that's why all they want to do, all of their energy is channeled into making other people share in their misery. And that's a really sorry way. That's very pathetic. It's pathetic in both senses of that word, you know? And it's really a shame that that something like a tool like the internet has facilitated so much of that negativity, which is why I think it's good to do things like this that show that you can be critical of something without being a dick. I'm sorry, but you don't have to. We don't all agree here on everything. And yet we can all still kind of relate to what's been said. You know what I mean? We've all compromised on what we've been thinking. Not entirely, but enough that we've had a constructive conversation about it. No one's going away. I like, like I, I think I can speak for everybody. Like I don't think anybody's mad right now. I think everybody had a pretty good time, you know, and there needs to be more of that. It's not that hard to do. It's really not. I feel like it, the irony is that people are so negative and yet I think that it takes more energy to be negative than it does to find things to be positive about. I really do. I can think of a hundred different positive things to say to each and every one of you right now. And if someone was like, we'll say something negative about each one, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> like, there's nothing. I, there's nothing that comes to my mind. Like, it would take effort. It would take no effort for me to pay every single one of you 100 compliments right now. It would take so much effort to try and dig something up out of some cesspool of my brain that I could find to complain or say something negative. And yet that's what these people are doing. And I'm like, you're wasting so much time. There's so many good things that you could be enjoying. Why do you want to be miserable? Like, don't. Don't do that. You know, like what you like, don't like what you don't like. And then if you don't like something and you can't be constructive about it, don't say anything. Right. It's not that hard. You know? So not a conspiracy, but somebody got the ball rolling and it's it still hasn't hit the bottom yet. I agree that it's not necessarily conspiracy. 
I think it's more they knew that people hated Scrappy and they fed into that hate. And I think because of that, people started realizing that maybe Scrappy's not that bad. And why are we showing him all this hate when, you know, what did he really do wrong? He was annoying. He was a bully. He kind of grew out of all that stuff. So I, I think they just were looking to feed off of the people that hated him. And in turn, maybe they got rid of some of that scrappy hate instead of making it worse. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what would you guys want to see that could make scrappy better? What do you, how do you think that he could be better? Trevor, we're gonna start with you because you brought this up. Do you want me to? You can show it, sure. I'll put my money yeah. where my mouth is. <laughs> can you all see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, re I redesigned him in a way that I think would, would please me and I think it would please a lot of people. So basically you want cute puppy. I, I made him cuter. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and uh, I shrunk his head a little bit and then I made his paws bigger. I gave him a, an, an oversized collar to almost imply that he's wearing one of Scooby's old collars, which is like the ultimate in uncle respect. Like so, and you. since they have the same initials, I mean, I just think this is super logical. Um, cool. I've changed his color. I make him lighter, like a little more like his mom. So, I mean, this really isn't, this is halfway done. I, I was wanting to work on it more and I probably will. But um, but yeah, I made his eyes bigger and, and if, if there's ever color, I gave him blue eyes, Scooby has brown. So um, I shrunk his eyebrows a little bit, you know, to make him look a little less pushy. So, and I little gave him a little tuft of hair, kind of a little tuft of, of fluff there. So I, I really feel, I mean, not to be all braggy, but I really think like if say, Warner Brothers, you were looking. I think this would be nice. So. It's cute. It's cute. cute. It, so, it yeah, does kind so, of tone down his his pushiness. Yeah. Right. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I I kind of took the I took the filter of a pup named Scooby Doo rendering of him, and I put it back over his old model. So. So you all can tell me what you think of that. Of course, Wendy, the hundred compliments would come in handy now. <laughs> oh, and, uh, oh, and did you notice? Did you notice the ears? I sharpened yeah. them back. You oh, you did okay. the drawing, nice. you didn't. That is so nice. Go ahead. Yeah. So what do you May think? I go oh. ahead? Can I, can I go yeah. ahead? Okay. Sure. He is very <laughs> cute. I can't deny it. I actually, I do really like that design. The only thing that I will say, and it's not a negative, it just, is to me i don't think that he would be scrappy with that design because the design alone would demand a much nicer character like his character inside you know what i mean like i can't i can't imagine him being all like pur, 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 you know the way that scrappy is looking that cute in that style would that be a super cute character absolutely absolutely but I don't think that he would still be scrappy. So I feel like he would have had to have come from the beginning. You know what I mean? Like having not be like a redesign of the character, but like the design that they went with to start with, as opposed to like trying to change it, because I think it would, it would demand too much of a change of like the type of character that scrappy is, but there's no question. He's adorable. He is really cute. And I do like it better with the pointed ears. I do. Does look really good. Well, thank you. <laughs> I would have to say that I would change a lot about Scrappy, starting with his attitude <laughs> and his personality. So I do, Trevor, I do like your drawing because I do feel like that portrays more of the Scrappy that I would want to see. You know, I don't want to see Scrappy coming out with his fists flying and he wants to attack everybody. And, you know, to me, like like Wendy implied, he, <laughs> he sets a bad example. Wait, wait, flim flam, flim flam. Flim flam. Okay. Dan's <laughs> got it. I got the Bible. Let's open it. 
<laughs> ah, I'm sorry, Nikki. Go ahead. But, <laughs> but I would I would rather see Scrappy as a better example, you know, a, a better puppy, not not attacking people, bullying people, putting them in just running into danger with no even thought of anything that could go wrong. So yeah. I really like your drawing, and I would like to see Scrappy look like that. Well, thank you. Justin, how would you change Scrappy? Well, I don't know if I would really necessarily change him all that much, but I feel like to bring him back, like, it's really not that hard. Like, it's not as complicated as, like, they need to make it. Like, as, one, as long as you got the right people doing it, like, the, you know, a good writer that's not going to just crap all over him. Just bring him back. Don't make him just super freaking obnoxious like you see a lot of little kid shows today. You know, there's always either that character or the entire show that's just obnoxious. Don't do that. It's just going to continue to make people hate Scrappy. Just bring him back and have him toned down in a way that, like, maybe he even, like, reflects each member of the gang, like, their different personality traits. You know, he can be like Shaggy and Scooby. He can still be kind of like Vilma, like, helping solve the mystery. Like, he's got a brain to him, you know, leading, like, fred and you know i don't i don't know i don't know about daphne i don't know what i mean yeah i mean i don't know what what he would how he would uh reflect like daphne but uh has everybody charm else, like daphne there we go yeah the charm yeah, yeah i think he said that earlier okay I, I was trying to remember what somebody said i couldn't i couldn't remember <laughs> but uh yeah no um I, I just don't think it's really that hard to bring him back but i know it's going to be because there's just so many different opinions on him but like I said, I mean, I, I'm holding out. It's it's going to happen. I know for a fact it's going to happen. And like we were saying at the beginning of this panel, like it, that we've been seeing so many new merchandise with uh, with Scrappy on it. I mean, how can you continue to just put out products with him on it, but then still just don't even acknowledge him in the actual show that it's based on, like, you know, that it's from? Like, I'm convinced it's going to happen, and I'm convinced that it's going to happen at least within the next within from now between 10 years from now it, it, it has to happen um but yeah just bring him back and don't have him super obnoxious and i think uh i think it would click hopefully this we'll see what happens yeah. cameron what would you change about scrappy um you know I think if, 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 like I said, we are going to bring him back, I think you would have to just maybe tone him down a little bit. I, I just a little bit, but I love, and I'm going to take four. I mean, you four said something that just really gave me ideas for my response. And I, you know, I'll start with you, Nikki. I love how you said, you know, he, he doesn't need to be out with fist flying, you know, he needs to be in a way, yes, when the, when occasion arises, you know, when the monster's getting really mean towards the gang, you know, then he can say, hey, you know, put him up. That's that's reasonable, but not all the time. You know what I mean? Like I said, that's where it comes to toning it down. Um, Justin, I, like you said, I, I, I think he's going to make a comeback. You know, um, I, I also like what you said, Justin. I think Scrappy-Doo can embody all the Mystery Incorporated gang. And I think if they do bring him back, let's see him when he's a little puppy, but let's see him start to grow up. And that's when Trevor comes in, because I love your painting, Trevor. I think it's a really great, to me, when I see that painting you just drew, it's kind of like Scrappy is kind of growing up in a sense. You know what I mean? He's not as little as he was, but he's starting to kind of grow into more of a great Dane. And that's why, I, and I love the oversized collar. That's my favorite part about it because it's, it's it's so cute. Because you see puppies with over, oversized collar, guys, that is the most sweetest thing in the world. I mean, it's just it's so cute to see, and I like that. Wendy, I mean, I love what you said about hey, you know, Scrappy. You know, he is a good character. You know what I mean? And as far as Scrappy Doo goes. You know, he's got he's got that that courage in him. And Wendy, I've, I've heard you say that he's got that courage in him. You know, let's start really highlighting more on, on that courage. You know what I mean? And start really portraying a better message out to kids. You know, I think Scrappy Doo, y'all, has portrayed a good message out to kids in the past. But I think it was it was it was really strong. I will say that it was really bold. It was really strong. 
if we can kind of lighten it a little bit, but yet still make him where he is, what he, he is, who he is, but kind of just kind of make it just a little bit lighter where he's not always, you know, fist flying. He's actually thinking about things and maybe where Scooby and Shaggy can sit him down and say, Hey, look, Scrappy, you know, you got to learn from this. You got to learn from your mistakes. You can't always go in fist flying. And he, in the cartoon, he's like, okay, uncle Scooby, I'll, I'll do better. And you kind of see Scrappy start to transition better as he gets older and he starts to, you know, really try to solve the mystery. So just, you know, wanting to go fight everybody. I think that'd be a great transition. Don't y'all. So I yes. think, I think that's how I think we could bring him in, you know, bring him back in a way where it's not so not as bold, but yet show him when he's a puppy and how he grows up and to be his uncle Scooby. You know what I mean? And honestly, I think it would be cool where, you know, Something something happens to Scooby where you know Scooby gets trapped or Scrappy has to you know embody Scooby in a way to get him back you know and it would kind of show where Scrappy kind of jumps into Scooby's shoes in a way and to avenge his uncle you know what I mean where he's got to kind of take on that that Mansfield role you know I think that would be really cool to see I mean here's my thing y'all we got a great character on our hands and you know, instead of just writing him away and saying he's annoying, let's, if you, if, honestly, if you say he's annoying one more time, not y'all, but it's like just another fan, I'm going to say, hey, look, how can we turn it into a positive thing? Instead of saying he's annoying, say, hey, look, this is what I don't like about him, but hey, we can turn this into a positive thing. And like what Wendy said, why are we making all these negative comments? Let's turn these negative comments into positive comments. And I honestly think if Warner Brothers takes that approach, they will, they will have a great, great backstory on Scrappy, and they can bring him back in a way that would really help the franchise. I mean, because, guys, I'm just thinking, if we bring back Scooby-Dum, scooby D, Scrappy-Doo, the Hex Girls, uh, uh, more characters that have been in the franchise, uh, you know, Yabadoo, I remember that's, that's it's another one of Scrappy's uncles. And, I, and I, we haven't touched on that, but I love when, I love, love, the series where uh, uh, Scrappy went out to the ranch with the Abadu. And I, I'm, a, I'm a kid. I grew up on a cattle ranch. I still live on a cattle ranch in Texas, Northeast Texas. So I live out in the agriculture country lifestyle. That's me. And I love that. See Scrappy do. And they were, you know, chasing cattle or jumping on a horse. But to me, though, guys, it was like it took Scrappy in a whole nother realm, a whole nother world. And he flourished in that season, I think, that series. So it's cool to see cartoon characters taken out of certain situations and put them into other things. It's like people say, well, Scooby-Doo, when I think of Scooby-Doo, it's always a haunted house. When I think of Scooby-Doo too, I think of a haunted house. Yeah, but I like to see over the years how they took Scooby-Doo and it's not always a haunted house. It's on a beach or it's up in the mountains or it's in a different country. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I still have not yet seen a Scooby-Doo Canadian movie. I'm half Canadian. I would love to see. I think me and Wendy would be like all over the moon for that one. Absolutely. But all I'm saying is, though, is it's you've got these cartoon characters and there's so many endless possibilities. But it's up to Warner Brothers. Are we going to are we going to stay in our little box and hate Scrappy and, and not use the Hex Girls as much and never bring scooby Dumb and scooby D back and do these certain things? You want to stay in that box? Fine. But if you break out of that box, let me tell you something right now. There's so many awesome endless opportunities. It makes me smile. I'm smiling right now because I'm thinking to myself, wow, think of that. Think of how many, so many cool things that they could do. I mean, it's like Trevor said, what if we did a family tree Scooby-Doo movie? That would be awesome. That you know what I mean? Cool. I'm serious, Trevor. That's a great idea. It really is. Um, and so I don't know. I, I, I just think uh, as Scooby fans and, and, and our Scooby community, we are some dedicated fans. We've been, I mean, I don't care if you're five years old or if you're 90 years old. Once you're a Scooby fan, you're always a Scooby fan. And I think, I honestly think that Scooby-Doo will be around for another 50 years. I truly do. But Here's the thing. He's going to be around for another 50 years. Great. How are you going to, how are you really going to honor him for another 50 years? Because let me tell you guys something. If a cartoon character has been around for that long, you know dang well that cartoon character is doing something right. And if you have his little nephew, Scrappy Doo, and he's been a part of the franchise, Scrappy didn't really do anything wrong in my sense because 
like like y'all said, he saved the franchise in a way. You know what I mean? So he's contributed in one way or another. And I'm like Justin, I'm getting really fed up with the crap of everybody just, you know, tearing him down. Give him some freaking credit, y'all. He's been in some seasons. But we're, I know we're talking about a cartoon character. I'm getting fired up. We're talking about these cartoon characters, and they bring so much joy to people. And I, I've always wanted to shake Bill Hanna and Joseph Barbera's hands because those two men right there, they did some amazing, amazing work, and they created some amazing cartoons. And they brought smiles to people that were in situations of kids not getting told they're not loved. People starving of you know people people hungry people in 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 abuse situations but when you turn on hannah barbera do you see any of that no you don't when you turn on scooby-doo do you see any of that heck no you don't you see four kids a dog and a mystery machine and sometimes that little and sometimes could be a little annoying scrappy dudes there but he's helped out the franchise in more way than one and that's what i gotta say about it I still think that Scrappy can redeem himself if he does some anti-bullying campaign. I think that would be like a good that, way yeah. to bring him back. You know, if people have a problem with him because he was a bully, then, you know, you have him do that. He's an he's older now, so he understands that how he acted when he was younger was not the greatest. Bring him back, have him do these anti-bullying campaigns. He's teaching kids. He's teaching adults. I know adults that are bullied. Um, and you know, he, he has a purpose. And then once he's done that, it's like a clean slate for him and Warner brothers can start incorporating him into shows and movies and, and make him less annoying. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else have anything that they want to say about Scrappy? Dad. I was, I was thinking on that note, it would be cool to play it where he got tired of the, the friction. Sometimes maybe the other three or something thinking he was being a bully. Maybe he went back home to his mom and that could be where he went back to New York and went back to his mom. So it had given him the arc of, um, you know, having his own time with his family and figuring out who he was. And then we as the audience would see who he is too. You know, that backstory of him, you know, with his, his friends and his mom and uh, maybe taking care of her, you know, with, as a child, take care of a parent or something would be fun to see. And yeah, but yeah, that's one thing I, I just with the whole franchise, there's so many do's and I, I just long to see more of them and and they don't they don't deliver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have anything that they want to say? You know, I don't I, think I, I know it never happened, but if uh, oh, so if uh, if Warner Brothers like if there was a way that like the five of us could like write a script yeah. for like how to bring Scrappy back, you know, we've got three of us who love Scrappy and two of us, you know, who are a little indifferent. I think that would be awesome if we just came, you know, if if, if like they had like fans come together and just come craft the perfect story to like redeem Scrappy Do in a way that suits like everybody whether you love him you hate him or you know eh, he's okay um yeah. i mean i know that would never happen but you can dream and i think that would be incredible so yeah great idea justin yeah well i think Wendy. the beauty of it is sorry to interrupt i mean scooby we love him and he's been so consistent but one of the things i'm about to bring up is one of the things i usually can't stand you know when people talk about mickey mouse or this or that or even the simpsons i can't brag about scoop because even though he's been in continuous airplay technically his series has not been you know as long lived but the fact that the franchise gets turned over into something new would work for us as an advantage this next go around just bring him back bring him back with a wonderful story some depth and a lot more love and just put it out there for people and i think it'll be all right does that make, I mean, because they did Mystery Incorporated, they did Be Cool, they did, um, you know, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who. So the audience, the kids and teenagers now are used to seeing a change every few years in Scooby. So I think it should be easy for them to put him back. So. 
Yeah. Wendy? I was just going to say there is an episode of Scrappy and Yabadoo, and I couldn't think of what the name of it was, so I looked it up. It's season one, episode four. It's called Runaway Scrappy. And I think that everyone who either loves Scrappy or dislikes Scrappy or is indifferent should find that episode and watch it. Because in that episode, Scrappy overhears Deputy Dusty and Yabba talking about getting rid of the little bugger. Now, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but they have like an infestation of, of bugs or something. Like they're not talking about Scrappy, but Scrappy hears them talking and he thinks that they're talking about him. And so he packs his little hobo bag and he's like, well, I'll leave then. And he leaves home and gets caught up with these jerks and stuff like that. And it, it ends well, but there is like a moment in it where he gets kicked to the curb by somebody else too. And he's crying and he, he just, the way that they drew him and the way Don Messick says it, and he's just like, nobody loves me. I swear, even now that like chokes me up so bad. But it is a really great episode of, like, he's just a cartoon character, okay? He is. But at the end of the day, if we're talking about cartoon characters as, like, people, which is kind of what we've been doing, he has feelings, too. And I love that episode for how it illustrated that, you know, this character that gets so much hate. Like, if he was a real person and you were treating him like that, this is the evidence of how you would be making him feel. And if it doesn't like pull at your heartstrings a little bit, then maybe you don't have a soul. I don't know, but it's very eye opening. I can, I like, I was a kid when I watched it and it really struck me. And at that time, I really wasn't aware of any like intense scrappy hate from other people. You know what I mean? And it was just so sad to see him dejected like that, you know? And just, just him walking around and nobody loves me. I was like, it's okay, Scrappy. I love you forever. <laughs> you know, Wendy, that is a good episode. And I'm glad you brought it up. Because um, I was thinking, you know, I, I watched all the Yabadoo episodes. And that was one of my top favorites. Um, and I love, I will say this. I know we're getting close to the end of the panel. But I love that like you said, Wendy, you know, he has feelings. And I love how in the Scooby-Doo episodes, it can show how, how a cartoon puppy or a, or a dog or a character or whatever can be vulnerable. Yeah. And, it, and, and to me, like we guys, like all of us talked about, the Scooby-Doo franchise teaches us lessons. And to me, the Scrappy-Doo, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be yourself. And I feel like that's what Scrappy-Doo's kind of taught us in a way. It's okay to be yourself. Sometimes, you know, and I've had to learn that going throughout life. I was, was, when I was a young kid, I thought everybody liked me. I thought everybody just wanted to be my friend. But as you go out throughout life, there's going to be people that hate you. There's going to be people that dislike you. There's going to be people that are going to be jealous of you. And, and you know what? And, and I feel like that's what Scrappy, you know, has done. And, and that's kind of how we were all talking. If we could bring them back, you know, Nikki, you know, saying, bringing them back in, a, in an anti-bullying, you know, campaign, that would be great. You know what I mean? Showing how Scrappy Doo has feelings and, and people are like, wow, you know, maybe that's, that's a restart of a character that someone has, has written good, but over the years, some people have taken them in a bad, you know, direction and now we're putting them back on track. You know what I mean? And I think, that's why I've, I have really clicked with Scooby-Doo and, and Scrappy-Doo and, and these cartoon characters so well growing up because I have gone through bullying. I've been bullied growing up. I have gone through hard things in life. But when I watch Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, they don't try to act like somebody else. They act like themselves and they're true to who they are. And to me, that's teaching the kids a good lesson. Be who you are and love who you are. And if somebody can't love you for who you are, then they don't need to be in your life. And yet, granted, I know we're talking about cartoon dogs, but cartoons really do affect us. I mean, Wendy, you're an artist. Nikki, you're a collector. Trevor, you're an artist and collector. And uh, Justin, I mean, you, you collect like I do. I mean, we all have something in common, but this cartoon dog, and I don't think any of y'all will argue with me, this cartoon dog has touched our lives in more ways than one. 
you know? And is there going to be people out there that say, man, y'all are weird for doing these panels and y'all are weird for collecting. And you know what? There's always going to be those jealous people. You know what I mean? And honestly, am I angry at them? No, I'm not. I feel sorry for them because you never know what somebody, my mom and dad always taught me this. You never know what's going on in somebody's life. You never know what happens behind closed doors. And I feel like these cartoon characters have always been there for us. And so I think, like we said, guys, bringing Scrappy-Doo back can, can really show people, hey, you know, Scrappy was down, down in the dumps and they, they really wrote him bad, but he's making a great comeback. Maybe, they're, maybe you're going throughout life and, you, and people have written you as a villain in life and people think you're just an awful person. But are you going to go throughout life always being hated or always being disliked? No, you're going to make an effort to come back and, to, and to, to really make an effort to try to change who you are, not change who you are, but um, really make an effort to, to do better. You know what I mean? To where you are, you know, who you are and people can love you for who you are. Does that make sense what I'm saying, you guys? Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to say? All right, before we go, I would like you guys to let me let everyone know where we can find you on social media. Trevor, we'll start with you. Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, Funky Philosophy Fridays, and all the sounds are Fs, so <laughs> it should come up that way. Dustin? Yeah, you can find my account at Collector Scooby on Twitter and Instagram. Wendy? You can find me on Twitter or WordPress. I'm at Wendy Loves Jesus. Or you can find me on Instagram. I'm at Wendy Bridge, Bridge with a Y. Cameron? You guys can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Scooby and Cam. And you can also find me on Facebook at Scooby and Cameron. And I'm Nikki Blake. You can find me at ScoobyAddicts.com. Thanks, Home Plan. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thank you for tuning in to another scooby panel i'm nikki blake from scoobyaddicts.com if you like these panels please subscribe to my channel for more great discussions a very special thank you to pop artist trevor hawkins scooby collector justin sharon cameron bates from scooby-doo and cameron 2 and blogger artist and scooby collector wendy bridge scooby and shaggy were voiced by scott innes Check out Scott's page, Scooby's Meddling Kids with Scott Ennis on Facebook. Scooby Panel is now available in podcast form on most podcast platforms. If you would like to support the Scooby Panel as a web series or now as a podcast, please go to support.scoobyaddicts.com. Scooby Addicts Art by Will Davenport. Video editing by Mike Burns. Music composed and performed by Bovine Nightmares. Please join us next time for our discussion with John Colton Barry.